right, I'm ready to start. Good morning. Welcome to the 9.30 a.m. public portion of the closed session of the December 13th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. If you would like to comment on a closed session item, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. In this part of the meeting, the council will receive public testimony and thereafter the public line will be closed and inaccessible. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Kalantari Johnson? Present. Boulder? Here. Cummings? Here. Brown? Here. Myers? Here. Okay. Vice Mayor Watkins? Here. And Mayor Bruner? Present. Thank you. The first order of business on this morning's agenda is item number one, referral to closed session for purchase of easements for the Newell Creek Pipeline from Felton to Graham Hill Road and Brackney Landslide Risk Reduction Projects. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, please call in using instructions on the screen and raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone <coughs> or select the raise hand feature in the webinar controls of your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. If there are any members of the public joining us here in chambers and wish to comment on this item, number one, please line up to the right of the dais. You will each have two minutes to speak. We request that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of the name in the meeting minutes. I am now looking for a motion on agenda item one. And actually we do have one hand raised. I'm sorry I didn't see you. Attendee with phone number ending in 4844. Go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, members of the community on City Council, this is Robert Norris of Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom, the group I work with. I just wanted to uh, commend and thank uh, Bonnie Bush, the city administrator, for making available um, the claim forms that you're going to be considering on the closed agenda, two of which have to do with police misconduct. Uh, but um, still, the problem remains. I keep getting them late and because they're not posted on the agenda as they should be because they're public documents. So I would simply urge the council to direct the administrator or suggest to her anyway that it, is, it's, it would be a good idea to actually make this document, which you, these, these claim forms in their entirety, which the city public doesn't know about, can't see the details of, whereas they can with every other city council agenda item, make those available for people to look at and so they can then meaningly contribute during this uh, open interval that you, that you are required to provide under the Brown Act. And I think you're also required to provide all the documents since these don't really have to do with actual litigation in terms of actually going into it. And these are public documents that uh, are available in public records. So please do this. And again, thank you, uh, Bonnie, for making these available to me. Although, again, it's such a late time that I can't really meaningfully comment on the two items involving police misconduct. Thanks. Okay, let me make sure there is nobody else, no other hands raised, there's nobody in person, and no other attendees hands raised. Okay, that concludes public comment on item number one, purchase of easements for the Newell Creek Pipeline from Felton to Graham Hill Road and Brackney Landslide Risk Reduction Projects. I'm now looking for a motion on agenda item one, referral to closed session. I'll move the item to closed session. 
Okay. Item number one. I have a motion by Council Member Myers to refer to, refer to closed session the purchase of easements for the Newell Creek Pipeline from Felton to Graham Hill Road and Brackney Landslide Risk Reduction Projects, seconded by Vice Mayor Watkins. I will now ask the clerk for a roll call vote. Council Member Calentari Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Brown. Aye. <clears throat> Myers. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. And Mayor Bruner. Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak to any items listed on the closed session agenda? We have items two, three, four uh, on the agenda as well. And if there are any public comments on the closed session agenda items, now is the time to call in. If you're attending virtually, please raise your hand or dial star nine on your phone or select raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. You will have two minutes to speak. <coughs> Looks like we have one hand raised. Uh, Sean Barrow, go ahead and press star six to unmute yourself. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you for the welcome. Uh, City Council um, uh, and President, I am uh, calling to, uh, in reference to item number three, uh, the claim against uh, the City of Santa Cruz. Um, I submitted a claim to the City of Santa Cruz um, for uh, my vehicle being towed. Um, my wife and I came to Santa Cruz for a, a a day at the tea house spa. Uh, we got there early. We went to the pier first to find a place to eat lunch. We parked in the parking lot on uh, Elm Street at that time, which is also available in my claim. There were no parking signs posted. Um, when we came out, our car was towed. There were now seven parking signs in the eight spots where my car was the one with no parking sign. Um, and we went through this process to speak with the cops and the sergeant to get the claim form. And then we had to go pay to get our car, uh, out of, out of Hawk. Now, my, my biggest concern uh, about this process is that, uh, in those conversations with the police officer and the sergeant, uh, at the time is that they overlooked my experience at, at, with this matter. I worked for 27 years for East Bay mud, whereas water distribution, uh, crew, uh, crew foreman and assistant superintendent, and then the assistant, uh, uh, then the uh, superintendent of a service area. I've been responsible for towing people's cars. Uh, I understand what, what posting and signage is for. Um, I, I know what it is to do emergency work and to do plan work. Now, I've had to be that person who had to tell my risk management department that we had to tow that car because of an emergency. It is completely different when, when there are no signs and then we post signs and then we made the mistake of towing someone's car when the sign showed up after. Now I have a valid uh, parking ticket for that stall at that time. We got there at 10, my valid parking ticket ended at one o'clock at a minimum, whoever called in, whenever they showed up, I know this, this call came at 1145 to get my car towed. If they had waited the minimum three hours, we would have already been gone. But that wasn't the case. What happened was we came out at 11:45. Our car your was time gone. has your time is up. If you could, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other attendees um, in person? Is anybody here to speak to any closed session agenda item? Okay. And seeing no other hands raised virtually. This meeting is now adjourned and council will go into closed session. Members of the public that are attending, please leave the meeting and rejoin at 11.30 a.m. when the regular meeting resumes. Thank you. And if council members can turn off your cameras. Good morning and welcome to our 11.30 a.m. session of the December 13th 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. 
I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Calentari Johnson. Present. Holder. Here. Councilmember Cummings is absent. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watkins. Here. And Mayor Bruner. Present. Thank you. Our first item uh, is item number six, a light pollution presentation. And I'd like to welcome Jeff Perry, International Dark Sky Association. Hi there, welcome. Hi, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, council members. I have a PowerPoint presentation that has a lot of slides. I'm gonna go pretty quickly with everything. Um, again, my name is Jeff Perry. I'm a volunteer for the International Dark Sky Association, the Santa Cruz chapter. Um, we have been uh, meeting monthly uh, for about five years to discuss the issues about light pollution. Uh, International Dark Sky Association was formed back in the 1980s to help mitigate light pollution. Next slide, please. Artificial light at night affects all living things on Earth by interrupting the Earth's ancient rhythms of bright days and dark nights. In 2016, a worldwide scientific study was done titled The New World Atlas of Artificial Night Sky Brightness. In conclusion, it told us that one third of all human beings can no longer see the Milky Way due to light pollution. That included 80% of North Americans and 99% of the United States. This problem is growing at 2% per year and less than 1% of the basics of light pollution is known by the population. This is why we are here today. Welcome to the 1%. Next slide, please. Light pollution in recent years has become increasingly severe with the availability of low cost, high intensity, blue rich white color LEDs. LEDs can be a part of the solution through the use of warm color LEDs incorporating automated controls such as dimming, time shutoffs, sensors, and shields. Next slide, please. The American Medical Association has found that exposure to blue-rich light at night has resulted in increased cancers, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. They warn that bright residential nighttime lighting associated with reduced sleep impaired daytime functioning and obesity. Next slide, please. Santa Cruz has a health in all policies ordinance. Light pollution is a health issue and could be addressed when considering new policies. Next slide, please. Entomologists are convinced that light pollution is contributing to a great worldwide die-off of insects. Next slide. Um, Studies are published regularly providing the detrimental effects of artificial light at night on birds, amphibians, and fish. Next slide, please. Now, the International Dark Sky Association has teamed up with the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America and drafted the five essential lighting principles that include, number one, lighting should have a clear purpose. Number two, lighting should be directed only where it's needed. Number three, lighting should be no brighter than necessary. Number four, lighting should only be used when needed. And number five, the warmer color lights, use warmer color lights where possible, 3,000 Kelvin or less. Next slide, please. Now, who here has been kept awake by lights streaming into their bedroom window at night? Nobody? Yes, me too, <laughs> me too. Um, this is prime example of light trespass when light is falling outside of the property boundary onto another property or home or sensitive environment. Next slide, please. This is one illustration to show how important light fixture shielding is to prevent uplighting, glare, and light trespass. Next slide, please. Now, all modern light fixtures should have a BUG rating. And BUG is an acronym that stands for backlight, uplight, and glare. These ratings are numerical, and the lower the number, the better the rating. 
ideally being closer to zero on all three ratings. Next slide, please. Now, brighter lights do not always mean increased safety. Lighting directly shining into people's eyes, called glare, can decrease visibility and safety. Glare is especially concerned for the mobility of disabled people and those over 60 years old. Motion sensor lighting is a better deterrent to crime by alerting others that there is activity in the area. Here are a number of studies I will not recite to save time, but you can find them on our website, darksky.org. Next slide, please. Now, unshielded light fixtures causes glare and increased contrast between the light and the dark. Next slide, please. By shielding the light fixtures, diminishes glare and focuses the light on where it is needed. Next slide, please. Light pollution is also a waste of money and energy. About 35% of lighting worldwide is wasted light shooting straight up into the sky. When we do the math, we spend around three to seven billion dollars a year on wasted light while adding 15 to 21 million tons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere each year in the United States alone. Next slide, please. Now, the, it's the blue-violet short wavelengths that, are, that cause the most disruptive to human, animal, and plant circadian rhythms. Amber lights are not as disruptive to the circadian rhythms of all life forms. Next slide. The California Building Energy Efficiency Code, Title 24, gets revised every three years and now includes lighting regulations on new buildings to conserve energy and to decrease light pollution. Next slide. Title 24 defined the lighting zones from dark parklands through bright metropolitan downtowns. That may help confine light pollution. Title 24 also gives local governments, such as the Santa Cruz City Council, the authority to increase the local stringency and boundaries of these lighting zones. Next slide, please. The Illuminating Engineering Society of North America and IDA came up with a model lighting ordinance. Recently, Monterey has enacted a lighting ordinance, and so has Malibu. Next slide, please. While Title 24 currently does not regulate lighting on existing structures or government buildings, other cities, counties, and regions in California have implemented lighting ordinances to help address the issue. Many towns and regions have found that by carefully designed outdoor lighting and preservation of the night skies contributes to their appeal as a tourist and vacation destination. Next slide, please. The California Green Building Code, as adopted by the City of Santa Cruz Council, also provides regulations about shielding and controls of exterior lighting on new high-rise, four stories or plus, multifamily buildings. Santa Cruz has adopted only the most basic option of Cal Green. The City Council has the option to expand the scope of the Green Building Code to apply additional types of buildings. Next slide, please. The 2030 general plan includes a section for a lighting ordinance. A strong and enforceable lighting ordinance in Santa Cruz will allow our town to contribute to the light pollution solution. The Santa Cruz chapter of the International Dark Sky Association would like to help the city of Santa Cruz implement changes to enhance the experience of nighttime environment for all. Next slide. Um, now, there are many quotes in the general plan, the 2030 general plan, that I am not going to recite to save time, so we can go to the next slide. But in chapter 11, I will say, it is quoted, adopt or adapt a model lighting ordinance and design guidelines jointly developed by the International Dark Sky Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society of North America. Next slide. There are more experts um, here and consider the appropriateness of lighting when reviewing proposed development or renovations of parks and recreational facilities, which leads into our last slide. 
sports lighting. Recent advances in LED technology, lighting technology, have offered lighting designers the opportunity to develop lighting sources strong enough to light the field of play and small enough to be effectively shielded. With those advances in lighting technology, recreational sports lighting can be configured and designed to be effectively shielded to illuminate the field of play and minimize or eliminate glare and light trespass. IDA has a design certification process for this. Last slide. Thank you very much. Please let me know if you have any questions or if you're interested in becoming involved. Thank you very much for that presentation, Jeff. I know this has been a topic um, that we've uh, explored and like you mentioned with our California Building Code and Green Code and um, I know Public Works um, has also recently had some projects where lighting has been a priority and it's something I find really fascinating and, and was not aware until recently and I'm happy I hope you have the slides that we can all receive the slides and continue working to make improvements um, in that area with lighting. Thank you very much. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Dettel as well. He has been very helpful in helping us mitigate light pollution. Thank you. And Mr. Dettel is our uh, Public Works Director outgoing. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Okay. Our next uh, presentation is, uh, let's see, is Nicole Brown here? Hi. Hi. Do you, uh, would you like to step forward or come forward, please? Um, I have a mayoral proclamation declaring December 6, 2022 as Nicole Brown Day. And um, this, this item came forward, thank you to Vice Mayor Watkins here, um, who uh, introduced me to no Nicole Brown, who does amazing work in our schools. Um, and I'm happy to read all of what you do and what you've done and, and hi, what you've been through. Um, and, you know, reading about your story and where you've come, it is my great honor to present this mayoral proclamation to you today. Um, I myself was in a, a car crash uh, five years ago that was life-threatening. I was in the hospital for three months and had to learn to walk again. And so um, your strength is inspiring. Thank you for sharing um, your story with, with everyone. Whereas Nicole Brown's tragic hit and run incident that was caused by a minor driving under the influence which left her paralyzed has fueled her determination and inspiration. And whereas Nicole Brown continues to use her story and experience as a learning opportunity for youth in Santa Cruz County by speaking as a testimonial speaker at the Santa Cruz County Office of Education Real DUI Court in school assemblies. And whereas despite the daily challenges and trauma that Nicole Brown experiences as a paraplegic, she finds the courage and commitment to reshare her story in the hopes of helping others. Whereas Nicole Brown has recently connected with the person who has caused her injuries approximately seven years later and has embraced this person with love, forgiveness, and connection. Now therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, in recognition of December being National Impaired Driving Prevention Month, do hereby proclaim December 6, 2022 as Nicole Brown Day in the city of Santa Cruz because of her commitment to prevention and awareness, and I encourage all citizens to join me in this observance.
Thank you. I just wanted to briefly say a few words about Nicole, if I can, just briefly. I, um, I have the honor of witnessing her testimonial story in front of hundreds and if not thousands of students throughout our county and they are sitting on the edge of their seats listening as she has the courage to share and relive her story. And I've also seen her over time transform her story to one that is not only about prevention and awareness around driving and drunk driving, but beyond that around just this transformational ability to have forgiveness and love. And I am moved every single time your story is truly inspiring to me and to others, and we're so grateful at, at the city here, within our entire county. I know you have your, um, your support team here, my colleague, Denise Pittman-Rosas, who also does so much work. We're really lucky to have you in this community, and we want to support you and acknowledge you, and you deserve it. So, thank you. And thank you, Trevor. Well, we can all learn. being here and thank you for thank inviting you. us. All right, our next presentation um, is a mayoral proclamation declaring December 30th, 2022 as Mark Dettel Day in the city of Santa Cruz. I'd like to invite our outgoing Public Works Director, Mark Dettel. Hi there. Hi, good morning. Um, and I understand uh, Sergio is here as well. Hi. Would you like to begin? We have a special presentation, and if you'd like to step up to the mic, please. Hello, everybody. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm just here in part from Senator Laird, and um, he told me to uh, hand you uh, this uh, resolution um, declaring whereas Mark Dettel, Director of Public Works for the City of Santa Cruz, is retiring after more than 21 years of dedicated service to the people of Santa Cruz, and in recognition of his astounding achievements, he is deserving of the highest commendations and a heartfelt thank you for a job well done. We have our official photographer, council member, Sandy Brown. Thank you, Sandy. <laughs> and I just, I'm happy to take the time right now to just read this. And really, this is your moment. Um, and, you know, I met Mark Dettel back in 2006 when I sat on a downtown parking task force committee and um, ever since then I really appreciate all the work you've done in so many facets in our city that most people don't realize so I'm I'm happy to read this whereas Public Works Director Mark Dettel has brightly resourcefully and steadfastly led the largest city of Santa Cruz department for over 21 years, and during his tenure has managed 273 staff across five divisions, providing uninterrupted, essential, and quality of life service to the people of Santa Cruz. And whereas Mark Dettel developed a strong team managing resource recovery, wastewater system, engineering, traffic engineering, parking services, 
and operations that have been recognized with project awards many times over. And whereas Mark Dettel's leadership and accomplishments are inspiring as he has consistently gone above and beyond to help city residents, businesses, and visitors. And whereas Mark Dettel established a funding source, Measure H, for road maintenance that has been significantly improved, Santa Cruz Road quality oversaw expansion of bike facilities, including pedestrian bridges, coastal rail trail projects, the Arana Gulch multi-use trail, and the use of green markings in bike lanes to improve safety and resolved conflicts to allow the construction of the Beach Street Bikeway and completion of two beach area roundabouts. And whereas Mark Dettel oversaw completion of the San Lorenzo River flood control project process to FEMA certification and directed the conversion of street lights to LEDs, and the expansion of streetlights along the San Lorenzo River levee, thereby, thereby improving safety. And whereas Mark Dettel oversaw wastewater treatment facility and resource recovery facility power generation improvements, reducing our energy costs to keep rates down and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And whereas Mark Dettel extended the life of the landfill by 30 years, by replacing the soil historically used for daily cover with tarps. And he has been a leader in Cowell's working group that led to Cowell Beach Water quality success in reducing levels of ocean bacteria pollution, resulting in three consecutive years that Cowell Beach has no, no longer been included on Heal the Bay's beach bummer list. And whereas despite often limited time and resources, Mark Dettel's creativity was able to meet community needs and time and time again, and his accomplishments and community contributions are far too numerous to name on this sheet. <laughs> and whereas after working hard overseeing dozens of projects, one could often find Mark Dettel, paddle in hand, ready to compete on the local pickleball courts. <laughs> And whereas Mark Dettel has enjoyed a prolific career in his hometown and now looks forward to playing more pickleball, enjoying the Santa Cruz beaches, and spending time with his family. So now, therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim December 30th, 2022, as Mark Dettel Day in the city of Santa Cruz, and encourage all citizens to join me in acknowledging his 21 plus years of dedicated service, expressing gratitude for his bountiful contributions to our safety and quality of life, and wish him well in his retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Clearly, I have not done all this by myself. <laughs> um, I have a huge um, group of quality staff that really deserve the credit. Um, I feel like I'm a conductor sometimes and just try to orchestrate, but they do the work and they do amazing work. And um, I feel I've been very lucky to uh, be able to work in my hometown the last 20 years. That's just unbelievable gift and to be able to give back and see the improvements. And we have a, you have a strong group of department heads that work as a team um, that carry out your, your work. And we have a strong group of leaders in the department and just amazing what we can get done. It's uh, with the support of the council and uh, the residents, we can deliver the projects and the work and we've done time and time again. And they continue to bring in uh, grants and um, to deliver these amazing projects. And I just wanna thank you for the opportunity. It's been awesome, so what a ride.
you so much, Mark. Wow, I think a lot of these folks in the room are here to acknowledge that too. So thank you all for... Our next presentation item I will move to later in the agenda. So we will, that is um, item number nine. Uh, so we will now continue with our, the rest of our agenda. I have a few announcements to make and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. First, I'd like to say that today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25, and it's streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. Our rules of decorum are here in person on the window ledge to my left. It's my job to keep the meeting running without disruption, and we ask that you respect your fellow citizens when you are inside or outside the chambers. For the consideration of our community, please stay home if you have any symptoms of a cold or flu or are feeling unwell in any way. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today and are attending virtually, call in at the beginning of the item you are wishing to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone only. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's your turn for public comment, you can raise your hand virtually by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. Please note that public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are items numbers 11 through 36 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, we will continue. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions. There are none. Okay. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on our closed session this morning. Good afternoon, Mayor Brunner, members of the city council. This morning, the council met in closed session at 9.30 a.m. in the courtyard conference room. Prior to adjourning into closed session, the council by motion referred items 5.1 uh, through 5.28 to the closed session regarding purchase of <coughs> easements needed for the Newell Creek pipeline project for, uh, and the council met in closed session for the purpose of authorizing the water director to negotiate easement agreements and to provide direction to the water director regarding price, terms of payment of both. Council then adjourned uh, to closed session uh, to discuss the following items. Uh, item two was a conference with labor negotiators involving the POA, police management, and SEIU temps. Item three was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims. Those are the claims of Sean O. Barrow, John Henry McGuire, Todd Pinsky, Anthony Pacheco Lopez, Sandra Loskatoff and Michael T. Alexander. Those items are also listed on your consent calendar for action this afternoon. Uh, item four was a conference with legal counsel involving existing litigation. There were two litigation items in which the council received a report from and gave direction to the city attorney's office. Those items are Herman uh, Martin and Carrie Herman versus the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, second item is the City of Santa Cruz versus the Regents of the University of California. Those items are both pending in the Santa Cruz County Superior Court. Council received a report and gave uh, received a report from and gave direction to the City Attorney's Office. Item five was the aforementioned 28 parcels of real uh, property uh, that was ref that were referred to uh, closed session at the outset of the meeting. I'm not going to read the 28 uh, addresses or APNs but those are available to members of the public 
uh, on the post signature. And there was no reportable action. Thank you. At this time, I will move on to item number 10. And this is an opportunity for council members to briefly state any uh, significant report outs from external boards, committees, or joint powers authority meetings that occurred. Um, and I will start with council member Brown. Thank you, mayor. Uh, just a couple of reports this time uh, with some very good news. Uh, I'll start with the uh, RTC, the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard by now, but I'll just say it again, uh, that we have officially, uh, Santa Cruz County has received, and, and the city uh, have received um, combined over $115 um, million dollars for um, six transportation projects in Santa Cruz County, and that includes uh, $35.7 in funding specifically for uh, City of Santa Cruz Rail Management for segments eight and nine. So these grants are in large part going to help us build out our rail trail infrastructure. Um, we did very well in the, um, the round. <coughs> and um, so I, I bring this up even though it's been widely uh, advertised <laughs> that this happened and we're all really thrilled um, because I also wanted to add I attended the RTC open house on uh, that was last Thursday, and had a chance to talk with staff at the RTC, um, just you know, informally, and um, in those conversations, it became so clear and it was consistently expressed how um, wonderful uh, the RTC staff feels about working with city staff, the relationship that they have, uh, the teamwork that, um, they, you know, the, the, the real, feeling like they're a team, and um, it, you're just so effective. Uh, Mark, you're still here, so I'll say it. I don't know if Nathan's still here. Um, but, you know, a lot of compliments for city uh, public work staff and, and others who have been involved in this process, and so I just wanted to share that. It really was, it was just really heartwarming to hear this so consistently and like crystal clear how well you work together. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Uh, the RTC meeting, we also, uh, the, the commission voted to move forward on an environmental impact and some advanced engineering for the rail trail. Um, so we are moving forward and I'm very excited uh, about that. Uh, the AAA, the Area Agency on Aging, we received, in addition to some of our regular business, we had a meeting with the Seniors Council, a joint meeting, which we do annually. And there was a panel on senior volunteerism and I, there's so much I'd like to say here about it. It was amazing. Um, uh, it's introduced by Karen Delaney and really facilitated by Karen Delaney of the Volunteer Center. She's also an internationally recognized expert on volunteerism. She had some amazing, uh, you know, stats and, and just information for us, which I won't share here, um, but more coming as we work at the AAA to um, really develop uh, volunteer programming and, and model programming in, in, in a systematic way. Um, because a couple of the things that she said, which I'll just share a couple. Um, one, um, she, th these are stats that I thought were so interesting. A well-run organization will see 18 to 25% turnover in volunteers on an annual basis. Um, and during COVID, it's been over 50%. So um, a lot of work to kind of bring people back into uh, volunteer opportunities, uh, you know, the need for diversifying those opportunities and making... Uh, you know, really including volunteers. I also want to add that <coughs> I learned that Gen Xers um, are, <laughs> some of you will appreciate this on the council here, um, are, um, have historically been the highest um, level, had the highest level of participation in, in volunteer opportunities. We're a small and tiny and under-recognized group. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of opportunity as um, Gen Xers begin to enter retirement to really capture that and work in new ways to develop volunteer opportunities. I just wanted to share, it was so interesting and, and you know, just energizing. And um, so more, more to come on that. And I think I'll leave it there. Other, other commissions were uh, limited. Um, Thank you. Substance, thanks. Um, Councilmember Myers. 
Mayor, I uh, actually did not have any meetings this past due to the holidays. Most of mine are at the end of the month, so I don't have any updates right now. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, similar, um, I think the last Metro Board meeting we had, we already reported on, yeah. And so we have one tomorrow, or Friday. Um, our Health and All Policies Subcommittee did meet, and we um, have, were brought forward with a timeline for the tobacco waste product work that we'll be considering this next year in 2023. Um, we also looked at the A City Like Me report that we partnered with Santa Cruz Community Ventures to do. Um, we got some of the key findings and some recommendations, and, and that'll come forward to the full council early next year. And then I'll let my colleagues fill in if I missed anything. Thank you. Um, council Member Golder. We did have a microphone. We did have a public safety committee meeting, and um, there wasn't really any action taken at that meeting. It was more of an update. And so I don't really have anything significant to report out from that meeting, in, uh, unless um, Vice Mayor Watkins disagrees with me on that. Thank you. <laughs> Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, let's see. So my colleagues reported on the uh, meetings. The only thing I would say about the public safety is we talked a little bit about really refining our intent and purpose and kind of maybe bringing to the full council at some point an opportunity to look at how we as a community can define public safety, which I think will be a really interesting process and I look forward to working on that um, and then visit Santa Cruz County met there is a uh, discussions of a new location and that will be forthcoming as well and um, we're lucky to live in a really wonderful place with a lot of diverse opportunity here um, and then just in terms of the representation on the farmers market board just continuing to work with the farmers market board and the city and um, in light of the outcome of the election on uh, either temporary and ultimately a permanent location. So that is also underway. And I believe that covers my updates. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Council Member Cummings um, will be rejoining us a little bit later this afternoon, but did um, email me his um, report out for the Criminal Justice Council. Uh, and so I will read that on his behalf. The Criminal Justice Council approved their 2022 annual report, which this year focused on emergency calls related to mental and behavior health. This report provides two key elements in understanding local law enforcement response to mental and behavioral health calls, a comparative snapshot of mental and behavioral health policies, trainings and procedures in Santa Cruz County law enforcement agencies, and a look at what mental and behavioral health calls look like when law enforcement arrives, from whether and where a transport was needed to when the calls occurred and even whether an arrest occurred. The report was unanimously approved by the CJC and it is recommended that the report be used to help inform policy and decision making around expanding mental and behavioral response by law enforcement and expansion of mental health and social worker response to mental and behavioral health related calls. And that concludes, I have nothing further that has not been reported out. Um, so that concludes our council report outs. Thank you. We will now continue on with item number 11. And um, this, well, item 11 starts the consent agenda. So um, with the consent agenda items 11 through 29, uh, members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now would be the time to call in. If you wish to comment on items number 11 through 29, instructions should be on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device. You can raise your hand if you're joining us virtually by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls of your computer. If you're joining us here in person, you can line up to the right of the dais, my left, and uh, all items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on, have questions, or pull any items? 
Uh, Council Member Myers, Council Member Brown. I'm gonna just have a comment on uh, 26. A comment on number 26. So I also have questions and comments on 26. I uh, was going to pull the item, but I have spoken with our staff and hoping that they can uh, join us to answer some of those questions and talk about um, some additional direction. Great. So I'll, I'll try to do it that way. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have questions and comments on number 26. Okay. Vice Mayor Watkins. A brief comment on item number 21. Okay. Any comments or questions? Okay, um, so we will begin um, with questions and comments from council and then I'll move on to public comment. Uh, so let's begin with item number 21. Vice Mayor Watkins, you had a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, you know, just thank our planning department. I don't know if there's anybody here from planning, but you know, this was a lot of work that went into establishing these nexus studies and fee structures for new development that is happening in our community and how some of those d dollars can go towards supporting um, the public good in terms of public safety, as well as the child care uh, impact fee. And which is something that's near and dear to my heart, knowing that we have such a, um, a desert, if you will, of child care opportunities for people and families. And was really excited to see this proposal come forward the money um, being uh, collected, as well as the opportunity and potential for a really amazing facility um, moving forward in the mixed use library project. So that's my brief comment in, in excitement and support of that moving forward in that way. Thank you. And now we will move on to item number 26. Uh, Council Member Myers, you had a comment. Yeah, I just, um, for the members of the public, this is the um, item 26 is the San Lorenzo Flood Control Project Federal Emergency Management Agency Accreditation, Vegetation Management and Burrowing Rodent Mitigation Projects. It's authoriz authorization to advertise and award. Um, and I spoke with the staff off and on over the last couple of days, as well as some of the community members that also wrote in um, and also contacted me directly. Um, I think just for the public's knowledge and sort of the history behind why we're where we are where we are, which is that the city is now taking over basically the management of this federally funded flood management program or project, which basically means that people living along the river who have been susceptible to flooding now have some protection for their homes and their businesses. But it also means a trade-off that we actually have to maintain the lower part of our river, the lower two miles through city, through the city as a as a, basically a flood control channel. And we are one of the few cities in America that actually have a flood control channel that looks like our river. Most flood control channels have a cement bottom and they're built to move water out, out of the river as fast as possible. And we have a very unique situation. So I always like to tell that history a little bit because we really are something very different nationally in what's going on in our riverbed where we are actually able to maintain native vegetation. It does need to be maintained each year. You've seen folks down there with tractors moving the sediment, but um, it's very unique that we actually preserve the lower two miles of the river, at least with some riparian habitat and protection for water temperatures for our steelhead populations as well as all the birds that come and go from our beautiful river and we get to enjoy it as a park. So that in that context, this, this project is now needing to look at what's called certifying the levy or certifying the project, which basically involves the Corps of Engineers being able to in inspect, inspect the, the actual infrastructure, make sure it's gonna be safe if there is a big flood in Santa Cruz. So I've always known about this because I've worked on the river for two decades. Um, we knew this day would come where we needed to have this assessment done. 
it's an important part of maintaining actually the river as a as an actual natural area as well. If we fail this, you don't want to go the other direction. You want to stay in the direction we are now because the federal government can come in and just denude the whole thing. So I think it's very important to put the context in place. I had a really good conversation with the staff um, and with some of our local organizations yesterday, last night. Um, I stressed this, the idea of really kind of moving towards an adaptive management approach eventually where we're not taking out all the habitat, even the small bits of habitat that I've seen grow up over the 20 years I've been working on the river. Um, plant, I planted some of those trees. Um, now they're very tall, which is great. We see value in those for habitat for birds, for, for nesting and foraging areas, and, and they're important. Even if they're somewhat altered or maybe areas next to them are altered, we still can retain some habitat value. So, I mean, I think my main message and my comment to our, to our public works and our parks department is this, this is 20 plus years in the making, the river we have now, and we need to maintain that moving ahead. It's been compromised on both sides. Many people would like to see the river not you know, completely managed the way it is, but we have a functional system that's supporting a population of steelhead as well as many, many bird species. And I think this is a good, a good adaptive management approach. I know in the first year or two, we're gonna have to do probably more, more trimming and, and getting an opening to the vis, visual, visual, be able to visually look and assess the condition of the levees. But um, I think in the, in the future with the qualifications that have been put into the bid, we will also see improvements and hopefully an adaptive management approach. My one comment would be, and I bring this up a lot, is it would be really nice to also be able to map our work areas each year. And not only map the work areas, but maybe working with folks like the Coastal Watershed Council or others, we might be able to additionally get some volunteers to do some actual identification to see how our native plants are responding. Um, I remind the public that rivers really love to tear themselves apart. We just don't like them to do that in the middle of our town. So we have a safe, a safety mechanism here called our levee system. But rivers are meant to be disturbed. That's when they thrive. That's when the animals use them the most. And so, you know, disturbance is a natural thing in a river corridor. So, but I think there's selective things that we can do and be very um, intentional about tracking the changes along the river course. So, um, thank you to our staff, um, and uh, I'm happy to um, support the item, but would like to, you know, again, emphasize this adaptive approach we have to grow into so we can maintain some of those habitats over time. So thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Uh, Council Member Brown. Uh, thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> so I, um, I did send some questions in advance, which um, thank you, Nathan. You... Uh, said you'd be willing to take on here. I do want to raise them here. I recognize we have a packed agenda today, but um, I, I do think that there are a lot of questions that have arisen that um, we can maybe get some of them answered and help people feel a little more comfortable about what the process is going to be moving forward. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, because, you know, I mean, the city itself and many environmental organizations have been working for a long time to... Um, you know, and, and to invest in restoration of the, the river. And, you know, I think that um, making sure that those efforts aren't undermined or um, kind of sidelined are, is really important. So um, <clears throat> the first question, and so I have four. Thank you, Nathan, for being here. Um, the, the first question uh, is why are grasses, why are we intending for grasses to replace native ground cover along the levee path? Um, do you want me to just, you have them, so I can just say, say them all and then let you go for it, if that works? Okay. Um, what kinds of pesticides and herbicides, this comes up in, in other areas as well, are being considered for um, vegetation and, and rodent removal? Uh, what, and are there alternatives that have been explored, uh, less toxic alternatives? And then uh, fourth, where can members of the public um, get access to the complete FEMA revision of the Army Corps of Engineers specifications for vegetation management on the urban stretch of the river. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member uh, Brown, uh, Nathan Wynn, City Engineer, um, Public Works. I uh, appreciate the, also the comments from Council Member Myers on this um, critical project uh, for the city and the residents, as well as the businesses that are surrounding this 
um, again, beautiful resource, but also a, a flood control project. So as we're moving forward to get our FEMA accreditation, you know, happy to answer some additional questions and do some additional outreach as we uh, proceed with this process. With regards to the um, ground cover and shrubs, as um, Council Member Myers um, alluded to, we need to be able to do some visual inspections. So the existing ground cover and shrubs that are blocking the view of the uh, outer bank or even some parts of the inner bank of the levee um, need to be trimmed up. And if they can't be trimmed up, we need to look at um, removing some of those plants if need be, such as the ice plants where that kind of more of an invasive species out there, which make it really difficult for us to manage going forward. Um, we'll be doing that in public works. We'll be doing that in partnership with uh, Parks Direct Department to determine those locations uh, for um, ground cover um, trim back and removal. Um, with regards to the pesticides and herbicides, those aren't set in stone yet. We've basically said in the scope of work that um, those are tools that can be utilized um, once a contractor is hired, we'll evaluate um, whether um, they'll be proposing what type of treatment it, uh, <clears throat> they'd like to use out there. It's a submittal process that will again go through Public Works and uh, Parks and Rec so we can review and approve and determine what's the best product to use for um, our community um, as well as, you know, on site out there. Um, alternatives to pesticides and herbicides. Um, we are going to be looking at um, some alternatives going forward when we talk about our ongoing maintenance. Uh, again, uh, Council Member Myers um, alluded to that this first take at um, getting our levy into compliance will feel like a big swath of trim back because there's a lot of vegetation out there that is not in compliance. There aren't any tree removals as planned, but trees will be limbed up, bushes will be um, trimmed back in order to see that ground cover of uh, visual inspection. As far as the um, standards from FEMA accreditation to the Army Corps, uh, in all reality, that hasn't changed. There, we have actually had an exemption through the Army Corps um, several years back for some of the areas for some of the plantings, but over the years, over the decade, I'd say, um, some of those plantings have gotten a little um, beyond what's acceptable. And so since us, we're going through this FEMA accreditation process, um, we're going through, we just have a higher level of scrutiny at this point in order to get into compliance. So that's why it feels um, the conversation or the some of the um, comments of, um, may feel that we're having a drastic approach, but really we're trying to get ourselves into compliance. And then as Council Member Myers mentioned, you know, uh, look at an approach for managing going forward, whether it's an adaptive management or including maps of um, work year by year is something that will be considered. So appreciate the uh, opportunity to answer your questions. Thank you. I, I do have a, a couple of comments. I, th I think I, I know there are members of the public who are here, so maybe I'll wait on those. Thank you. Um, I I would just like to add, to, uh, Nathan, since you're here, thank you. Uh, I know Mark Dettel is here in person. Um, I just want to thank staff for being responsive to the community concerns that have come in over the last couple days uh, since the agenda was posted regarding this item. Um, and. You know, I know that city staff is committed to keeping as much vegetation as possible. I know that um, some of the very specific concerns brought up have already been um, taken into consideration and implemented in terms of, um, you know, updating the rejuvenate. Re rejuvenation mix and um, using hand tools and qualified biologists and um, really having that city uh, staff and control over over this process and I think all of that is really important for our community to know and to hear um, because um, you know even though it is a levy, it has become a very integral part of our nature and um, our habitat is everything. And we are so lucky to have, you know, our coastal watershed and people like Jane Mio who work every day in those areas to preserve and protect. Um, and it's really an asset in our community. So thank you for um, addressing all the concerns that have come in and for really making the preservation and protection um, a priority within um, the guidelines that are required. And I understand the FEMA certification would need to be complete by March. 
with bids going out in January. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, okay, are there any other? No, okay. I'm going to bring it out to public comment on this item. And so uh, I will start with in person, please. And our first member of the public, welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is Lori Egan. I'm the executive director of the Coastal Watershed Council. Our work is solely focused on the revitalization of the lower San Lorenzo River. And the challenge of managing an urban river is complex. You're always balancing these different needs and benefits of this space. So what's in front of you today is this balance of flood protection and habitat protection. We are so grateful for the over 75 members of our community that came out to say that the habitat protection matters just as much as the flood protection. And thanks to that advocacy, city staff has been responsive in making the specific changes that May, uh, Mayor Bruner described. So at this point, moving forward, there are a couple of specific things that still remain, including the use of pesticides and herbicides that we believe still need to be addressed. We also would like to see some of the qualifications that we've included as desired, as required in this project to ensure that the contractor that gets this bid is equipped to balance those competing needs. Coastal Watershed Council will continue to monitor this work on the ground, making sure that we have that balance for our community. We also offer our resources and assistance in the maintenance and care of this space so that we can have this thriving urban riverfront where we can all connect to nature in our daily lives. So as a council, I encourage you to approve um, this item with these amendments today. Thank you. Thank you. Our next member of the public, welcome. Hi, I'm Kaya from the Coastal Watershed Council. Um, I would like to correct Nathan, first of all, the FEMA certification um, in the guidelines actually only allows for grasses and trees limbed up to five feet. Um, so if you go out to the San Lorenzo River and look at the outboard side and see the vast amount of removal, it's a little bit differentiated than um, what he previously stated. Um, Jane Mio and Coastal Watershed Council have been working on the lower San Lorenzo River uh, for a long time, and a lot of the native plants supply a lot of habitat and food resources, especially to our endangered steelhead trout. Um, even the outboard side of the river, the insects lay their young in the river, and that is the food for the steelhead trout. So the amount of vegetation removal will negatively affect that, and the amount of vegetation removal will cause erosion because in the specifications of the FEMA um, certification, you'll have to remove the majority of root balls as well. Um, and in the place, they will replace um, native glass grasses that will eventually get roots as well, but not similar to what is out there right now. Um, I propose that the city thinks a little bit further on this um, and thinks about mitigation at bare minimum, because under the Endangered Species Act, if you are to disrupt habitat vital for the endangered species, you must do mitigation. So um, I hope you think about that. Thank you for your comments. Uh, our next member of the public, welcome. Hi, my name is Unbelievably. Can you move the microphone yes. to your mouth? Thank you. My name, Unbelievably, is uh, Barbara Riverwoman. I was born on a houseboat in Minnesota long before I ever knew about the San Lorenzo River. So that's my name on my social security card and on my driver's license. <laughs> and then I find myself living at El Rio Mobile Home Park which is the officially designated spillway for the San Lorenzo River. So I understand the flood control issue from a very real and personal perspective. But I've also um, been the co-author of the San Lorenzo River blog um, for five years with Jane Mill. And uh, we have documented uh, for five years, every single week, all of the bird life on the river there, um, many people don't know that that two mile swath of um, stretch of river um, has been um, identified as the 14th of 100 top birding spots. Of 100 top birding spots in the entire county, 
that two miles stretch has been identified number 14. Number 14 of 100. I hope you all remember that number. It's very important. I've also sent you um, the, a report commissioned by the city council in 2015, uh, a base study that identified all the birds on that river. And then they identified 103 different species in a three-month period in 2015. So it's in a major wildlife habitat. And um, I want to thank Council Member Donna Myers for her very useful history. She's played a really important role in protecting the river. Um, and um, there was another person I wanted to thank. Well, I thank you, Sandy, for reading our letters and pulling Is that my time? That's your time. I haven't even started to read my talk. But it was about the pesticides and the herbicides and why, well, the reasoning behind the visibility issue. I hope we can get more answers. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Our next comment here in person, welcome. Hi, my name is Jane Mio, and this morning I was down at the river working with the downtown street team stewardship program, and the kingfisher was calling, and the warblers were harvesting in the bushes. What is also at stake with this drastic reduction is the community cohesiveness that CWC and the Estuary Project have created. We have brought together a huge, diverse group of people, young, old, everybody, to feel proud of what they have done, to feel proud what they have achieved, and that actually cannot be threatened. So I urge you to find ways that the uh, council, uh, <laughs> coastal watershed and estuary project can work together with the reduction of saving and helping to maintain what we can so that the community can still be engaged in the river and in the river work. And I want to just say that I am very, very grateful for achieving these changes because when it first came to us, when we first heard about it, it was devastating. Seeing that these changes have been integrated and are possible are actually what I believe in collaboration and co-working can achieve miracles. Please, please keep going along that line. Namaste. Thank you for your public comment. I am going to just double check our virtual attendees. I'm not seeing any hands raised virtually. Is there anybody else uh, here in person for public comment? Okay. All right, that concludes our public comment. And so, Council Member Brown. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to um, ask about the possibility, or I'm not sure if it is gonna require any formal direction, but um, Nathan, when we talked earlier, um, I suggested that um, I might, that it might be worth uh, responding to the Coastal Watershed Council, the Estuary Project, and concerned community members to give an opportunity for them to be engaged with this process moving forward. And so I just wanted to ask you what you believe the best way to accomplish that would be. Um, I mean, I can just make the statement. I see you're nodding a little bit. Um, but if, if there's a, it just feels like if we can get them into the, conversation around what work is going to be done, how they can be in, informed and weigh in and collaborate and continue to do the work they're doing. Um, that, that's what I'm hoping to accomplish here. So um, sure. that's, do you have any thoughts on how to do that? Um, 
Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member Brown, for giving me the opportunity to, to speak again. Yeah, I think um, staff uh, can still do a lot of public outreach as a part of this project. Um, we are working, uh, we worked with Jane and walked that project with her to talk about looking for alternative locations that are at the toe of the slope so that we can still have those ecological resources adjacent to our river. It's not necessarily in the levee bank itself. Um, and so there's other spots that we're gonna work to identify along the uh, levee to um, keep those plantings, to keep this collaborative work that's this process that's happened over the last several years. And so um, it's our, our public works team, our Parks and Rec team working together to reach back out to um, Coastal Watershed and other stakeholder groups. Um, just because uh, this process moves forward with taking this project out to bid does not mean that the, the public outreach has to stop as a part of this project. And so, you know, I just want to make that very clear as well. Okay, so, so just recognizing that, that that is a priority to continue to engage with the um, stewards of the river and, and folks who care about it. Um, I think that'll really go a long way to assuaging concerns, fears about what, what's gonna happen and that line of communication is just so, so critical. So I really appreciate you being responsive on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I will, that concludes our uh, uh, questions and comments on our uh, agenda, consent agenda items, one or 11 through 29 on our agenda today. One thing, can I just add we really We have quickly? one more afterthought. Just to, I'm sorry, um, uh, so in terms so of the- Is the this for Nathan? This is for Nathan, yeah, sorry. Um, in, I, in terms of timing, how how do you anticipate this rolling out just so folks can kind of be prepared to track it and um, not necessarily always wait to hear from the city? Sure, yeah, I think what we, we our goal would be would have a, another public outreach meeting probably with Coastal Watershed, be able to walk the project with them and then uh, ask others who would like to join us on that walk to talk about the project. We, we've been out there a couple of times now with Jane Mio, but if she'd like to come back out and other Again, people who've been involved with this restoration work out there, I'm happy to talk about the project in person to really dive into the details, you know, once you're on site. Um, I would hope to do that before um, we actually open bids so that we have some feedback from the community that's been working out there. And so right now we're tentatively scheduled to do a bid opening on January 10th. So um, okay. probably within the next three to four weeks, you know, maybe before the holidays, try to do a, uh, an outreach effort. We'll work through with Lori and others to, to get that scheduled. Great. And last question, um, would it be possible, I, I'm not asking about this coming back to our agenda, but to get maybe a memo update um, on how things are going and, and if um, and when that would be like realistic on a timeline, like sometime in the spring, um, I'd rather hear about how things are going than get a bunch of emails saying you need to, <laughs> you know, you need to fix this. Um, yeah, we so. can, we can, uh, you know, we can typically, we'll provide our project updates to the, through the city manager and, and you can decide at what time's appropriate to bring it to council as far as an FY up, update for, for the, uh, for you and the community. Yeah, it would be great to, to just get something there so we know yeah. what's happening. Thank you. Thank you, council member Brown. This, this would be a great uh, communication project as well that I know we are working to improve um, citywide on all our projects so this definitely is one I would thank you to the community members for bringing up all of the concerns that I know are a priority for this council to um, um, address and staff has heard loud and clear so thank you and the work will continue to um, make the best decisions moving forward on this Okay, at this point. Move the consent agenda. I have a motion from Council Member Brown to move consent agenda items 11 through 29. Second the motion. And a second by Vice Mayor Watkins. May I have a roll call vote, please? Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Council Member Cummings is still absent. Brown. Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Brunner? Aye. Consent agenda passes unanimously with Council Member Cummings absent. 
Next up is consent public hearing. These items are 30 through 34 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment on items 30 through 34, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any of those items? Um, I have, uh, and I apologize, I was not able to send these in advance a couple, I just wanna ask a quick question related to item 31. Okay, council member Brown has a question on 31. And council member Golder? I'm just wondering, I didn't think about this either in advance, but for number 33, if there's any conflict of interest between the three of us that live in that neighborhood, like the existing. Question on 33. Okay. Um, we will start with a question on item number 31, which is the um, objective. objective standards. So the questions that came in uh, from a member of the public in multiple formats, I, I just wanna, um, I think I've got them here, I just wanna ask, um, and this may be for Claire, because I know there was an exchange between um, Ms. Brown and Claire about it. Um, hi, there you are. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is related to the transit map and, and transit quality, uh, actions or, or decision-making of with AMBAG. And so I'm just wondering if you could share with us um, so a little bit more information about how this works in relation to uh, changes in state law and the, in particular, high quality transit stops. So that's my question. Um, and I will try to keep it You're as much your in again. English as possible because it gets, it gets into the technical weeds. Yeah. So, AMBAG recently updated their long-range transportation plan. It's called the MTP-SCS. It's now the 2045 version. In their previous version, the 2040, they did their mapping in a certain way. We used that mapping as part of our GIS and applied it to various things such as density bonus, um, parking reductions for certain um, land use types, et cetera. As they moved to their 2045 plan, they did their mapping in a different way. At the same time, AB 2097 passed um, at the state. And what AB 2097 says is that if you are most types of development, there's very narrow exclusions, um, and you're located within a half mile of a major transit stop as defined by the state, then you cannot, the city cannot require you to provide parking. We can't. Um, we don't say that you can't, but we say it's, it's not a requirement that we put on the developments. Um, with AMBAG's new plan, the way they changed mapping is they had one map that's for um, high quality transit and one map that's for bus rapid transit. Previously, they were combined. AMBAG realized that this created a lot of confusion with the implementation of AB 2097. And so for the entire AMBAG region, not just for the city of Santa Cruz, they are producing new maps that show the applicable areas of AB 2097. Um, so this is not AMBAG making an amendment. This is AMBAG creating clarification based upon some confusion in what they did. Regardless, um, if AMBAG, it's not the city making a, determin a determination, it's if AMBAG makes a determination that the stop in question, which is near Staff of Life, on, on the east side, if that is in the planned transit stops, because the, the law allows for existing and planned, then AMBAG will make that determination and AB 2097 will apply. So it doesn't really actually overlap with our objective standards at all, and we don't have control over that. That's a, That was a discussion between AMBAG and our transit providers on what they project their transit level of service is going to be. Um, and they're just gonna create that clarification in mapping. Uh, previously it was in, we were surprised that then we thought it was out, but that could have been um, us, us misunderstanding and AMBAG recognizes that there was a lot of confusion there. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, if I could just say a couple things so we can move through this pretty quickly, I, hopefully 
happen that way. So I, I just want to say that um, I'm, when we get there, I do want to register a no vote on this item. Don't need to talk about why, the reasons why have already been said, um, but I do really do appreciate your um, helping me understand the complexity of this one and, and just say that I, I know that, the, I mean, this is something that has come up because there are people who are really concerned about the East Side Business Corridor and the potential loss of parking over there. And so kind of any, any of this is, it gets, causes people to be concerned. So I just wanted to put it out there. Yeah, can I offer one more clarification there? Um, in reading the correspondence that we got, I think it was portrayed as though we were going to come in and take away parking that exists. And that's, that's not the case. It's applicable to future development or remodeling or reuse of existing. But what you see there, by and large, you know, cities change very slowly. And so it's not going to be flip of a switch and all of a sudden tomorrow there's going to be no parking. And I think I definitely understand the, the fear that people have and it feels like a lot. But I do want to offer the reassurance that no, there's not a Santana Row plan and no, tomorrow there's not going to be, all of a sudden parking is going to disappear. So it really is state law came in and we are we are reacting to that as best that we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, that was, you know, one of the questions I had asked too. So thank you for bringing that up. And my understanding is that whether um, the Midtown gets added uh, back into this transit map that um, Claire was just referring to um, doesn't affect the objective standards decision that we make today. And um, just because parking isn't required doesn't mean developers would not provide parking, especially in areas of high parking demand. And um, how we plan for future um, publicly owned lots will depend on many factors, um, including private party responses and private sector responses and investments in both parking and alternative transportation approaches. Um, so thank you for that clarification. We had um, a question on item number 33 by Council Member Golder. And 33 is um, the 404 Centennial Street right-of-way abandonment at the frontage of the property of 404 Centennial Street located within the R15 single-family residence zone district. So I'm wondering if the council could move forward with the rest of the consent public hearing agenda. And then I might need to take a few minute break to do a little bit of research on the on the potential conflict question. Okay, so we have a question from Council Member Golder, whether there's a conflict of interest in voting on this item. Um, so our city attorney will assess that and we will come back to this item. Uh, and so we will move forward with the rest of the consent public hearing items. Uh, I will now, uh, if there are members of the public that would like to speak, now is the time to do so. Please raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature on your computer. When it's your turn to speak, you'll hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will be set to two minutes. We don't have any members of the public here in person. So I will go out to our virtual attendees. We are accepting comments on items 30 through 34, with the exception of 33 right now. And it looks like we have three attendees. First one being phone number ending in 4965. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hi there. Hi. Hi, yes. Um, I was the one that, that brought up the issue. I'm um, Candace Brown and also on the Transportation Public Works Commission. And we were told November 21st that this uh, change could possibly happen with the AMBEG maps. Um, the City Council was presented the idea that high quality transit would only apply mostly to 
that going up to the university, which isn't impacted as much because they aren't dealing with high density rezoning, which we are today with the objective standards. And so that's why I brought it up because once we make this change, if there is a change in the high quality transit, then, and if it does in the future affect the development standards when it comes to parking, then of course that would have a, a complete ripple effect with Midtown almost immediately. Some of these projects are, you know, more than 20 units, many are 50. I have one at the end of my street that's 100 units. And so um, there are dramatic changes um, to say that they would be going slowly when these projects would happen immediately, um, I think is, is sort of characterizing that in a way that I couldn't perceive myself, certainly seeing what's happening downtown. So I think it is prudent to consider the idea that we do have to mitigate and in my case, I think it would be prudent to recommend that you wait uh, for the MBAG standards before making a final rezoning of high density at 2.75 FAR, which is the maximum in the general plan. And it's not specified by right. Only 1.75 is specified by right in the general plan. And that was the rec recommendation of the original corridor advisory committee. They never recommended 2.75 FAR after doing all the analysis and parking on, on traffic parking and just the lots themselves and um, the appropriateness of uh, right sizing for that narrow corridor there. So, for your comment. Our next so, hand raised is I am watching you. Go ahead and unmute. Yeah, it's okay, thank you. Hey, I don't understand why the time is reduced to two minutes for this item, but anyway. Uh, there is a little new to say about item 31's proposed street tree in lieu fees for removal replacement I haven't stated before. The city can propose regulations and demand permits to plant and maintain street trees in the future on Parkway public property, but existing trees were planted and maintained by previous ordinances and cannot constitutionally be changed this way to react or retroactively apply in our good American law. The city attorney's argument, street trees are like sidewalks, is Swiss cheese full of holes. Trees are not sidewalks, and there are many reasons why sidewalks need to be permanently maintained, for instance, public safety, and those laws are old and not new, like these in lieu fees. Trees are optional, their existence not a requirement for everyone or for public safety, and the city has no stake or claim to them as they can be the private property of adjacent property owners, and if so, should be able to be removed at their will without charge especially for instance, if the trees are dead. Consider if you can, what besides size is the justifiable difference between trees and any other plant planted in a parkway? I joked last meeting about a tree in Bethany Curve Park that was long dead and wondered aloud about when the city finally got around to cutting it down, would they replace it or put the 1700 bucks in the kitty? And I was surprised and thankful when it was cut down very early the next day. Thank you to whomever. Uh, but no new tree has been planted. Will you be dropping a, a 1700 in the tree replacement kitty? Surely you wouldn't approve a new law that doesn't apply to the city, but mostly the poor saps who planted street trees in the past. I don't have a problem with such a law applying to new developments. That's a contract developers are going to have to agree to, apparently, if they want a permit. But no existing street tree owner has previously agreed to those in lieu tree replacement fees as a condition of past permits. A uh, few will want to plant street trees in the future, now knowing a perpetual obligation exists. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. It looks like that concludes the hands raised. We have one more hand. A phone number ending in 9078. Hi there, welcome. Press star Hello? six. Hi. Hi. I wanted to talk about the businesses on Soquel. Uh, the business owners on Soquel are really rightfully alarmed about the combination of AB 2097 and the city's proposal to increase the FAR way beyond the 1.7 FAR recommended by the Corridor Advisory Committee. They understand the threat to their livelihoods if the increased FAR is enacted today because it can't go down after it's once put in place. But do you recognize that this combination of changes is a threat to their very existence? 
downtown shop owners have the double protection of the downtown association and the parking district. But they also insist that on-street parking places remain at their front doors, even though they have plenty of off-street parking garages to serve their customers. What plans are in place to protect the east side businesses when this does come to fruition, if you pass this high FAR? The combination of AB 2097 and the increased FAR is missing the most important part. It doesn't have a plan in place to protect the commercial viability of our area businesses. Please keep in mind that your vote today will be the one that supports and ensures their ongoing existence or dooms their existence. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other further comments from attendees? We are taking public comment on consent public hearing items 30 through 34 with the exception of item number 33. Pardon me, Mayor. Uh, I have been able to uh, review the matter and conclude that the council members who live on the west side are all outside of the 500 foot radius of the Centennial Project. So you can take action on item 33 as well. Thank you so much. So we are able to proceed with item number 33. There is no conflict of interest in that item. If there are any attendees who wish to comment on item 33 as well at this point, um, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine if you are attending virtually. Um, and I'm not seeing any further hands raised. Um, I would like to ask another uh, clarifying question um, based on the comments that were made in public comment. So I will bring it back to council and um, let's see if anyone from um, item number 31 if any staff can clarify some 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 things brought up, uh, my understanding was the general plan uh, allows already allows for 2.75 bar, um, and so therefore we have to allow for 2.7 bar 2.75 bar. And there was um, a comment brought up about the 1.75 bar floor area ratio for those who are wondering what that stands for. Um, can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Mayor Brenner, Sarah Noisy from the um, Planning and Community Development Department. So um, the language that's in our general plan was written um, presupposing that the corridors plan was gonna be conducted. So it does currently contain language that is unenforceable in the way that the state laws have changed. So it um, contains language and Ms. Brown included this with her correspondence that says, you know, 1.75 FAR is allowed by right, and you can get up to 2.75 FAR if you meet certain specified standards that are in the zoning code. Those standards were canceled at when the quarters plan was canceled, so there we have nothing in the code to be those standards other than the code as it is. Um, under the state law, what this essentially means is that our general plan is allowing a 2.75 FAR, gives that allowance, and we don't have zoning that implements that. So. What that means with the way the state laws have shifted in the last couple of years is that the general plan governs, where the zoning and the general plan don't match each other and, and the zoning can't be used to implement the general plan, then we essentially have no zoning standards and we just go with the development that's allowed by the general plan. So the rezoning action that is part of the objective standards package makes that transparent and it just incorporates zoning that exactly reflects what is already allowed today under the general plan. So this is the development intensity that's being proposed and potentially approved by your council today is the same development intensity that has been on those parcels since January 1, 2020. Thank you for that clarification. So we're not increasing any far that's already no what's yeah allowed. that's already in place and has been for two years okay since 2020 um 
And then the um, parking issue that was brought up in, in comments, um, I know we touched briefly on it before, but just um, AB 2097 is a state law um, and its parking ex exemptions apply within a half mile of uh, ex uh, existing high quality transit. And so how does that affect the Midtown parking and the concerns that were brought up? And are you working with the Midtown um, area to address that? I know that um, you know, future parking demand really is, um, depends on a lot of factors um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so I just wanna address those concerns. Um, I'll start, Claire, and then you can step in if you need to. So uh, so there's a couple of things that are going on here. So first of all, um, I want to acknowledge that, you know, the state law, state laws are stepping in and overruling local rule in a lot of different arenas. This is happening to us in land use. It's happening about climate action. It's happening about parking. It's going to continue to happen. Um, you know, we are in a place at this point in the state of California where the housing crisis has created just a completely untenable situation. And so the state is trying to pull on as many levers as they can to support the development of more housing. So folks that are operating businesses in existing buildings are understandably a little bit unnerved when they hear about this, especially if they don't own the property where they're operating their business. Um, we understand that. A lot of the work that we do citywide is responding to issues as they come up. So, you know, this area along Soquel and in Midtown, it's a core commercial area. It's, uh, you know, a very important part of the community. And um, it's also zoned for commercial development. And most of the buildings that are there now, they're more than 25 years old. So there's already some amount of development capacity that hasn't been realized on those parcels. And some of them over the next 20, 30 years, probably will start to turn over and be redeveloped with new type new building. Um, we do have some things in our objective standards to maintain space. So there is commercial space continues to be available in these places because we do want to incorporate policies that ensure that commercial activity can continue to happen in this area. Um, and the issues with parking are going to shift. Right? If new development comes in, we're going to see parking demand shift. This is something that's contemplated in lots of different city documents. There's um, direction in the climate action plan, or there's a, an action in the climate action plan, I believe, that calls for us to really reevaluate all of our parking standards because we know that um, easy parking at destinations is one of the primary drivers of single person car trips. And so it's, you know, we're going to start seeing pushes on parking happening from a bunch of different directions and that's something that we're going to be working on in terms of implementing the cap over the next couple of years. So that said, um, a new parking facility at I think it's lot four on Soquel next to the fire station has been discussed at various different points in the past. Um, wait, 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 lot 32, fire station two. Okay, thank you, sorry. I don't know what the, no, the parking lot like, numbers are. Lot four me. is downtown. I think okay, lot sorry. 32. Lot 32. Is that, okay, thank you. I never said anything else. Lot 32, um, next to the fire station on Soquel, um, has previously been discussed as an, you know, a location for a new structured parking solution. So maybe that's something that will rise in priority over time if parking becomes really tight in this neighborhood. Um, I also just want to reiterate what Claire said earlier just because parking can't be required by the city doesn't mean it won't be built by developers. We see that with density bonus projects now, like in a lot of places, density bonus projects don't have to provide any parking. And many of them are still, most all of them that we've seen so far are still opting to provide pretty substantial amount of parking. So um, I understand that there are these concerns. I'm not gonna say they're unfounded. And I think that we'll just have to address those as they come up. It's not something that we can really um, plan ahead for like building more parking than we need is part of what got us into the tangle of traffic that we're dealing with today. So um, we'll just continue to seek feedback and hear from folks. And as issues come up, we'll, you know, discuss them with your council among our departments. They'll get prioritized in the CIP, you know, and we'll continue to move forward and solve them as they arise. 
Thank you. Um, can can I just um, add that it would be really helpful to engage moving forward with those um, SoCal Avenue and Midtown area businesses um, as much as possible in the process so they're informed along the way and not hearing about it um, after any decisions are being sure. made, but to be involved in that process. I think yeah, a good absolutely. point was brought up that downtown businesses have the downtown association and the parking district and some representation there. Um, but um, I know all of us can help with that too, um, but I think it would be really important based on some of the input that we received today to really make sure that they're engaged moving forward so that those concerns can be um, addressed. Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. Um, I, I did actually attend a meeting of the Midtown Business Owners Association, and they have regular contact with um, staff in our economic development department. Yes. And I know that parking is one of the things that comes up periodically for them. And um, just to report out from that one meeting that I did attend with them, the biggest concern that they had was um, building turnover and sort of being priced out of their existing buildings. And that is something that, you know, we've discussed with economic development, like what kind of supports can we put in place? And that's something that we're going to continue to deal with um, and face as it comes forward as redevelopment happens over time. Great. Thank you. I'm happy to work on that as well. Thank you so much. Um, are there any other um, questions or comments? Otherwise, I will, uh, from council, no, I will ask for a motion. I was just going to briefly, if I can, and then I'll make the motion. Great. Um, just, I want, I, but you know, Sarah, you brought it up in terms of the connection with economic development. So how we're working in concert with your division, with economic development and the Midtown Business Association moving forward and thinking about how to mitigate some of these impacts as they come about in the future. But I appreciate the explanations and the questions and the um, responses. And with that, I'm happy to move the consent public hearing items. Okay, we have a um, motion from Vice Mayor Watkins on consent public hearing items 30 through 34. Second. And I have a second by Council Member Kalantari Johnson. May we have a roll call vote? Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Boulder? Aye. Cummings is absent. Brown? Aye, with the exception of item 31, where I register a no vote. Thank you. Councilmember Myers? Aye. <clears throat> Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruno? Aye. That motion passes unanimously with um, uh, the exception of item 31. Councilmember Brown voted no, and Councilmember Cummings is absent. All right. Next on our agenda, is our general business items. We have item number 35. This is our City of Santa Cruz Children's Fund Committee appointments. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to council for deliberation and action. And I'd like to welcome um, Bonnie Bush City Clerk and Tony Elliott, our Director of Parks and Recreation. All right, thank you, Mayor Bruner. Uh, appreciate the chance to present um, this Children's Fund Oversight Committee uh, proposal to the council today. Um, kind of tag teaming here with City Clerk Bonnie Bush um, and uh, uh, Matt Huffaker, our city manager, has been involved in this process as well as three of our uh, council members, Vice Mayor Watkins, and council members uh, Calentari Johnson and Golder. So we'll welcome their uh, input and feedback as we go through here. But the the uh, request today and really the goal for today is to appoint uh, the first Children's Fund Oversight Committee uh, for the city. And so if I may, I'll share my screen 
and go through a presentation. I want to provide a little bit of context and background as this is the first uh, iteration of the Children's Fund Oversight Committee. So provide some background as we go through this and move toward uh, appointments to this committee. Uh, so give me one second and I'll share my screen. Okay, are you able to see my screen? Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. So the Children's Fund Oversight Committee uh, really was um, a, a product of Measure A that was uh, voted on in 2021, uh, voter approved ballot measure, which amended the city charter uh, to allocate, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna switch my screen here just uh, for a moment, I'm sorry. Here we go. All right, forgive that issue there. <clears throat> so measure A really established um, uh, new language in the city charter such that 20% of the city's cannabis business tax uh, would be um, a really earmarked toward early childhood development programs. So this is the children's fund. It was created by uh, measure A. The Children's Fund purpose and intent, um, and I've got these areas highlighted on the screen uh, before the council and the public here, but the, the purpose and intent of the Children's Fund is to support enhancement and expansion of evidence-based programs to prioritize access to early childhood development, prevention, and vulnerable youth programs without supplanting City of Santa Cruz services or investments. And the the monies, the second bullet point here, the monies are to be used to provide services to children and youth less than 25 years old in accordance with asset-based youth development principles and placing a strategic priority on serving children and youth most impacted by poverty, trauma, and violence. Um, so really the, the intent and summary is to serve our, our most uh, uh, at-risk and in-need uh, youth in Santa Cruz. And why does this uh, matter? So I think this is a key part that's really um, explained by Measure A really well. So cities will benefit when our youth live in safe, peaceful, and healthy lives, free from involvement uh, with the juvenile and criminal justice systems. Um, by helping City of Santa Cruz children and youth to succeed in school and graduate high school, prepared for college, career, and community, the city will benefit. And then fostering the healthy development of young children ages zero to five um, will have a positive impact on the Santa Cruz community as well. So the language in Measure A, just wanted to call some of this out really to talk about the context here um, and the importance of this children's fund as we look toward putting this committee together today. So over the last year, um, a, there's been a children's fund working group, um, which has included uh, Nicole Young from Optimal Solutions Consulting, our city manager, um, and then uh, Vice Mayor Watkins, Council Member Calentari Johnson and Golder. And so the purpose of that group, we really worked on trying to, trying to figure out based on the language in Measure A, how would we put this committee together? What is the purpose and function of the committee? How would the appointments be made? What would the terms be? How would all this work in the spirit of uh, reviewing past allocations, but most importantly, um, looking toward and, and ultimately making recommendations to the council for future allocations of the children's fund. So some of the outcomes here um, uh, were really geared toward the work uh, of the committee and arriving at what we are presenting to the council today, which is recommend, uh, recommendations on the representatives of the committee, uh, the terms, the appointment process, um, and then ultimately that purpose and function of the committee. And big picture for the council and um, big picture for the community as well. So this committee does not yet have bylaws. So with the appointments today, uh, the next step would be uh, to craft draft bylaws and then bring those back to the city council in the new year for ratification. Um, and then the goal would be for this committee to meet um, in kind of the late winter timeframe and into the spring uh, in its first meetings as it begins to contemplate um, uh, where have funds been spent uh, in the past? And then what recommendations will the committee have for the council um, as the council heads into the fiscal year 24 budget cycle uh, in the new year? 
So uh, before I move forward and we get to this recommendation process, and again, just for the council and the public, um, this has been, a, I think, a, a really important topic and one that we've uh, shared and uh, communicated with council on periodically over the last few years. But just recently, we've created a, a new city webpage with a lot more information. So for the community, in terms of how this money has been spent, where the money has been, uh, where the money has gone, the impact in serving the community, um, a lot of that data and more information, uh, more information to come, uh, will all be at cityofsantacruz.com/childrensfund. So. Um, any any information, any questions, um, a lot more information at cityofsantacruz.com slash children's fund. So we'll move toward uh, this process to appoint um, the uh, oversight committee. So again, just in terms of context, the um, uh, cities, let's see, I think I've got some typos on this page, but the city council shall designate a community oversight panel to make recommendations on the use of future revenues in a manner consistent uh, with this section, this comes from measure A, which may include, but shall not be limited to representatives of the following, um, Parks and Recreation Commission, Santa Cruz City School District, first five Santa Cruz, youth organizations and the city council. So what we've arrived at in the uh, proposal before the council today um, would be a seven member oversight panel. So it would include one member from the Parks and Rec Commission, one member from the city schools district, one member from first five, um, one member from a youth organization, two at large positions, so, uh, or, or uh, seats. Um, and those uh, were uh, part of an application process we'll talk about here in just a minute. And then one applicant um, or appointment from the city council, so seven positions uh, total. And I'll lean on the city clerk here in terms of our uh, process to uh, make these appointments, but the recommendation uh, will be to, and we've got uh, the names here. So the recommendation on the at-large positions, we've got two names, Rachel, Dan, and Donna Gefkin to serve as the at-large members. Those were the two applications that were received. A uh, recommendation to direct the mayor to appoint one council member and one member from a youth organization. And then to ratify the members brought forward um, and already recommended prior to this meeting by the Parks and Rec Commission, the school district and first five. So those three members um, are listed uh, on the screen here as well. Holly Locatelli, Chris Monroe and David Brody. So I will leave it at that and would welcome Bonnie Bush to speak to just the process um, and Mayor would lean um, uh, on your direction as well in terms of the best process uh, to make these appointments. I think the process may be a little bit different for, for each one, but would welcome Bonnie to weigh in on the next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Director Elliott. Appreciate the context and background and information. This is a very exciting moment. <laughs> I know I'm excited that I've watched this process evolve, so um, I'm happy. I, I think what, what I will do is separate out each of the three uh, numbered items in the motion and so that we can vote on each one. Does that work, um, City Clerk? Yeah? Okay. Do you have anything else to add? Um, no, I don't. Okay. <laughs> I, I will go out to public comment after we have any questions from council. So at this point, are there any questions from council? Okay, so I will um, take it out for public comment. Uh, there's nobody in person here. Are there any virtual attendees? If you would like to comment on Item number 35, City of Santa Cruz Children's Fund Committee appointments. Please press star nine on your phone um, or choose the raise hand feature on the webinar controls and um, you will have two minutes to speak. And I'm not seeing any hands raised from our virtual attendees, okay. I will bring it back to council. And so um, I will start with um, 
Uh, item 35-1 is appoint two at-large members to the Children's Fund Committee with terms ending January 31st, 2026. And uh, my understanding, this is the application process that happened and we had two applications submitted, uh, Rachel Dan and Donna Jeffkin, Gefkin, I apologize, uh, Gefkin. And um, so are, do any uh, uh, council members uh, have any nominations on those? So there's, are we to support one or two? <laughs> two. These are for the at-large members. So I would move to appoint Rachel Dan and Donna Gefkin to serve as the at-large public members. Second. Okay, we have um, a motion by Council Member Myers, seconded by Council Member Brown to appoint Rachel Dan and Donna Gefkin to serve as at-large members of the Children's Fund Committee with terms ending January 31st, 2026. May we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Um, Cummings is absent. Councilmember Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes six ayes with Councilmember Cummings absent. So moving on to 35, number two, direct the mayor to appoint one council member and one member from a youth organization to serve on the committee. I'd like to um, first ask council for any um, nominations uh, for a council member to serve. Council member Golder? I'd like to nominate uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Okay, we have a nomination for Vice Mayor Watkins. Any other nominations? <laughs> okay, may we have a roll call vote? I'm sorry, who was the second? Oh, I can uh, second. I can second. I, can second. Uh, I thought somebody's made a motion, so no. Councilmember Golder Vice. nominated. And no other nominations? For, so, by for a council member. Okay, so for con by consensus, it would be Vice Mayor Watkins. By consensus, Vice Mayor Watkins. Thank you, I know you've been working with this since its inception, so thank you for continuing the work with this. Congratulations. Um, and it, are there any council members that would like to nominate a youth, a member from a youth organization to serve on the committee? Council member Kalantari Johnson. Yes, uh, executive, executive director of United Way of Santa Cruz County, Keisha Browder. Okay, we have an, a nomination, is there a, any other nominations? Okay, so is that a by consensus? Um, we have Keisha Browder from United Way as the member from a youth serving organization to serve on the committee, thank you. Item 35-3. Ratification of members brought forward. We already have these recommendations here. Um, this was brought forward by Parks and Recreation Commission. We have Holly Locatelli, Chris Monroe, and David Brody. I'll need to ratify those members. I'll okay. A second. We have Vice Mayor Watkins with a motion to ratify the members brought forward by Parks and Rec Commission and a second by Council Member Myers. May we have a roll call vote? Council Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Golder? Aye. Council Member Cummings is absent. Br uh, Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. And Mayor Bruner? Aye. That motion passes six ayes with Council Member Cummings absent. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing more. And Council Member Kalantari Johnson. 
I just have a brief comment. I wasn't sure when the appropriate time for that was. Um, I do want to acknowledge and thank everyone who worked on this, especially Vice Mayor Watkins, who I think you initially brought this forward in like 2017 or something. So a long time. So this is a really special occasion to see it moving forward. Um, and I want to thank Tony and um, everyone on, us, on staff who helped us get here. I do want to mention that um, I've been in touch with and working with a youth action network and bringing in our youth liaisons per the Children Youth Bill of Rights that we passed last year. And there's interest certainly by youth in our community to be participating um, as part of this advisory committee. So one of the asks of the advisory committee is to engage with um, the youth liaisons to figure out a way that is meaningful and authentic for youth engagement in this oversight committee. Thank you very much. I'll keep my Vice Mayor Watkins. I could go on and on and on, but I won't. I won't. I will spare you all for that. But I do want to just thank the council for um, nominating me to serve on this committee. As mentioned, this is something that's near and dear to my heart. And it's something that we should be really proud of as a community, as a council. So I want to thank each and every one of you for um, really traveling these uncharted territories and waters, because this is a brand new thing. And that not having a dedicated children's fund, but in that it's using a portion of our cannabis tax dollars, which was a new revenue source, which communities rarely ever often see, um, to have it go to this purpose. I also just want to thank Parks and Rec and all of the attention that you put into creating this process that I think is um, holistic and yet not overly cumbersome and hopefully will serve as a great advisory tool moving forward and, and extended gratitude to those who will be serving and who have volunteered to serve as our at-large as well. Um, and I think just, you know, moving forward, there's so much opportunity to really celebrate what we're doing right. And all of these preventative investments matter, and we don't often quantify them in terms of what we're not seeing later down the line. So by supporting our youth, by supporting our families with childcare, we're supporting their ability to live in a balanced lifestyle here in Santa Cruz or after school care or others, right? And so however we can paint that as part of the bigger picture of our community and the wellness of our community and really in line with the health and all policies work, it, it's part of that. So anyways, I just, I will stop there, but I just wanna thank you all and I look forward to serving on this committee and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. We are very lucky to have this um, new committee moving forward, and I look forward to hearing about the work and seeing the bylaws next year. <laughs> uh, that concludes item number 35, and it looks like Council Member Cummings has joined us, and we are about to begin item number 36, Homelessness Response Quarterly Update. I'd like to welcome... I'd like to welcome Larry M. Wale, Homelessness Response Manager. Welcome, and while uh, Larry and Wally is getting set up, we um, have been receiving these quarterly updates. Um, this will be an update regarding some of the homelessness response programs since our last update and services, including our homelessness response action plan implementation, some of those details, objectives, and outcomes. And while he's setting up, maybe we'll, we'll take a five minute bio break and just give um, the tech a minute to get set up. Thank you so much. Okay, if council members can turn on your cameras. It looks like we have council members returning, all right. Is everything on track now? I think we're ready. Thank you, Mayor. Great. Thank you. I'm glad we were able to do that. So next up on our agenda is item number 36, Homelessness Response, our quarterly update. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now would be the time to call in 
using the instructions on your screen and the order will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from council and then we will take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action I would like to now welcome Larry and Wale homelessness response manager Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the Council, Larry and Wally, Homeless Response Manager. I'm pleased to present this quarterly update on our homelessness response programming. I'm joined this afternoon with my colleagues in our city's homeless response team, specifically our outreach team, uh, with Monica Hernandez and Jeremy Leonard, who will be presenting uh, as part of this presentation on their experiences and perspectives in doing this work. Um, and so they'll join me in a little bit. Uh, for this homeless response update, you will have noticed in uh, both the uh, staff report that's provided and the way we organized this presentation, where we've changed the format a little bit uh, to follow the areas of our action plan. So this is kind of a new organizing paradigm, if you will, to presenting this work. And so uh, we organized a report in our five action areas, which are building capacity and partnerships, permanent, affordable, and supportive housing, basic support services, care and stewardship, and community safety. So for this report, uh, so we have time for the presentations from my colleagues. Really just want to highlight a couple of items in each of those categories. There's more detail on your staff report, and happy to entertain any questions you have from the more detailed report. Uh, but we really just want to go through the highlights um, and key updates uh, in this presentation. Uh, so in the first action area, building capacity and partnerships, uh, the key pieces of updates on our partnership and collaboration involve our continued work uh, with local partners, including the county uh, and multiple community-based organizations and philanthropic organizations uh, that we're working coordinated to meet some of the shelter and service needs in our community as we continue to see behavioral health, mental health, and addiction issues are key struggles for our unhoused population. Um, and to address this challenge, we're taking a collaborative programmatic approach by working collaboratively to create systems of access and care to help people understand their options. And we're doing through that through outreach, service connection, coordination, shelter expansion. Uh, and a little bit later in the presentation, uh, I'll talk a little more in depth about the reef, uh, housing, uh, rehousing focused service coordination that we've been engaged with, with county and community partners uh, related to the closure of the camp in the San Lorenzo Park. The city and county also continue to collaborate on shelter expansion on the Housing Matters uh, campus at Coral Street. Uh, we're moving forward with plans uh, to demolish the River Street shelter that's in a dilapidated state and really trying to repurpose that site uh, for shelter expansion. As I've reported previously, uh, we're collaborating uh, on that work where the city will procure the sleeping shelters uh, for that site, individual sleeping cabins, um, and the county will fund the program and service operations uh, that would be provided by Housing Matters. Uh, so that's a key piece of collaboration to work to expand shelter capacity in the city of Santa Cruz. Um, in addition, a lot of work in this past uh, quarter has been done around expanding our internal capacity in the city. Uh, as uh, I mentioned at the last quarterly update, uh, we worked on um, the additional positions that were uh, part of the Homelessness Response Action Plan, specifically <coughs> making uh, the positions for our outreach staff permanent and expanding that team by uh, another part-time position, so we're fully staffed there. In this last quarter, the focus has been on standing up the new Public Works Homelessness Response uh, Field Division uh, that will be supporting this work as we do the homeless response work in a cross-department integrated and coordinated fashion. So this is a team of four and a half uh, full-time equivalent positions 
Uh, we have the field supervisor uh, on board, and the, recently the uh, field uh, workers uh, were hired. So this unit is nearly um, complete and uh, began operation in early November. Uh, community engagement efforts um, have has been, proactive communications has been a focus uh, over this last quarter. Uh, it's um, particularly during the San Lorenzo Park encampment closure process, we established regular updates, uh, both for internal and external stakeholders, including city staff, neighbors, business, community organizations, uh, partners, as well as the media. Uh, the city also published a new homelessness response website, which you can find at www.cityofsantacruz.com slash homelessness. And it now features a frequently asked questions uh, section that is informed by community questions that we receive. And there's also a news and update section that highlights recent activities, successes, and community engagement opportunities. The second action area of permanent, affordable, and supportive housing. Uh, update on our housing production progress. This work is principally led by our planning and community development departments. So this is looking at the expansion of affordable housing production. Currently, the city has over 2,300 residential units in process. Um, approximately 850 of those units are deed-restricted affordable housing units, and over 220 of those affordable units are permanent supportive housing units for people experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. In addition, there's two 100% affordable pro projects under construction, the 70 units at uh, Pacific Station South and 65 units on the west side of Cedar Street at Cathcart. Uh, in addition, um, at the Housing Matters campus, the Harvey West Studios project, which includes 120 permanent supportive housing units, uh, has had good success in achieving uh, its fundraising goals for that project in the last quarter. Uh, they've been awarded $26 million in funding from the state, and they anticipate construction beginning as soon as spring in 2023. Also over at Coral Street, we're moving forward with the master planning process. Uh, we've contracted with the Dolan Group to lead the design, master planning design process. Last night, we kicked off uh, the community engagement process with a uh, design charrette process. Uh, it was well intended. Uh, this was an opportunity for community members, service providers, uh, members of our unhoused community uh, participated as well in providing input on what are the key features and services that uh, should be integrated into, uh, as we envision, what uh, can be built out at that campus. Um, and so ideas around the type of housing, what it would look like, the different uses, the kinds of services that would be on that site, whether it be expanded medical care, mental health services, uh, basic hygiene services available not just to people um, that are in programs on campus, but available to the public at large. Um, so great conversation, um, great ideas. And so the design group will take that feedback from this initial uh, community meeting, develop some design concepts, and present it back in a month or two to get feedback on those concepts. So that's moving forward. and. Uh, There'll be more info at the next quarterly meeting. Um, also, um, an update on eviction prevention efforts. If you recall, back in April of 2022, uh, uh, the council authorized um, $150,000 to be dedicated to support eviction prevention efforts uh, in alignment with the county's efforts. The county invested $500,000. And this was really, um, at the timing, was associated with the moratorium from the state ending on eviction protections. Uh, so, so far, um, so that $150,000 augmented an existing contract with the Community Action Board. Uh, and to date, uh, that uh, $108,000 of that $150,000 has been utilized to support 40 households in the city of Santa Cruz. Uh, that encompasses a total of $111,000 people in those households. 
uh, so that uh, that effort has been effective and useful, and um, most of the funds have been expended to support families in need. Uh, the third action area is uh, basic support services, uh, which includes safe sleeping and safe parking. Uh, extensive work has been accomplished in this area over the last quarter and really over the, the, the entire year. Thinking about where we started in January uh, to today. Um, since the beginning of uh, two th 2020, back in January when we first opened uh, the 1220 uh, River Transitional Community Camp, the city has opened 165 safe sleeping and shelter spots um, and 27 uh, safe parking spots. Uh, and collectively, these services have, have uh, reached uh, and, and served about 310 individuals this year. Uh, a quick update on the Hygiene Bay uh, at the Housing Matters campus. Um, as you may recall, that this has been closed since about 2019 because of uh, its need of repair. Uh, funding was provided um, ultimately out of the American Rescue Plan Act funds, but that work be commenced back in August and is on track to be completed either at the end of January or early February. So that'll bring, bring back online much needed hygiene services, including showers uh, and restrooms uh, and um, a whole new uh, boiler system, water tanks, and um, HVAC system for the uh, poly loft building that it's contained in. Uh, a little bit more detail to just give you an idea of uh, the programs um, and uh, the outcomes that we're beginning to see. So at the city overlook up at the armory building, uh, this is, a, again, we've talked about 135 uh, tent space program. We opened the first uh, 75 at, uh, back in May, and the second um, phase of that shelter expansion utilizing the inside of the building uh, was opened in September for a total of 135. Again, this is a 24-7 staffed program from the Salvation Army that provides service connection uh, we now have other service providers that are up uh, working at that site um, on occasion to uh, support the service connection and housing navigation. So we have housing navigators from uh, Housing Matters that are on site on a regular basis uh, working with uh, the clients in that program on their housing efforts. We've got behavioral health on site. Uh, a couple times a month, as well as HPHP medical staff as well. So that's another aspect of collaboration uh, that is ongoing to uh, provide uh, more robust services for that program. And so far, we've seen 9% um, of the participants have moved on into housing or more stable shelter through that program. And it's served approximately 217 total individuals over the course of this year. Uh, 1220 River uh, Transitional Community Camp. Uh, this is the other city program uh, that is operated directly by our city staff. Uh, it's a 27 tent program. Case management services are provided weekly. It's self-managed program by the participants with community responsibilities. Uh, and we've seen uh, really uh, remarkable outcomes, I think, for the short time that this program has been ongoing. 30% of the participants so far have moved into housing or more stable housing. Uh, and at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Monica Hernandez, um, who will talk about um, a case um, study with one of the participants in the 1220 program about their rehousing experience. Good afternoon, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I'm Monica Hernandez, and I'm a member of the City Outreach Team. 
I've been on this team since July of this year and have been working in human services locally since 2015. Thank you for the opportunity to share a case study on housing out of the 1220 River Street Transitional Encampment. <clears throat> a couple who has lived in our community for many years were able to secure the space at 1220 the first week that we opened. Although they have been connected to Downtown Streets team since 2017, housing had been difficult to attain and still remains difficult to attain. With DST's assistance in, in employment support services and case management, one member of the couple was able to attain and maintain full-time employment since 2018. The other, partnered, the other partner volunteered with DST but still had the responsibility of managing the vehicle that they lived in, ensuring they would not be ticketed or towed, and other basic survival functions while their spouse was at work. Downtown Streets team helped this couple obtain an emergency housing voucher, EHV, in 2021 and provided housing navigation support. EHVs are tenant-based rental assistance under Section 8 that ensure the voucher holder does not exceed paying more than 33% of their income towards rent. With a combination of the voucher and funds made available, by the county and through Community Action Board's flexible funds, this couple was able to have their deposit paid for as well as furnishings to their permanent space. <laughs> Staying at 1220 meant this couple had a stable and safe place to sleep without worrying about having their belongings stolen, no longer having the worry of having their vehicle sighted or towed. It provided breathing room. They were no longer in survival mode as they had time and space to begin their transition from houselessness to housing. The participant who held the voucher could focus on housing searches instead of focusing on moving her vehicle while her spouse was at work. Her spouse was able to stabilize their health and could maintain full-time employment. 1220 provided the pathway to stable housing by helping this couple transition from living out of their car into a transitional community camp and into eventual permanent housing. One of my biggest takeaways from supporting this couple, navigating the process of attaining housing during their time at 1220, is how crucial it is to have, sorry, is how crucial it is to have an active, supportive, and transparent collaboration with other agencies. In this work, there is often an overlap and duplication of efforts when one agency does not have the awareness that another is already engaging with a participant. It would better serve all of our participants if the services they previously accessed or are continuing to access and are eligible for are reflected in Homeless Management Information System, HMIS. Working with this couple to obtain housing reinforced the need there is for permanent housing, but also for the need there is in this community for more housing stabilization support. It means so much to me that I'm still in touch with this couple and have the opportunity to continually witness their successes. And clearly by my getting so emotional, um, it's been a privilege to be able to help them finally get out of homelessness. Because that, as we know, is not always the case and it's incredibly difficult work. So thank you for providing the opportunity for me to share this very personal story. Thank you, Monica.
yeah, our city outreach team do incredible, difficult, emotional work every day, and uh, thought it was important to try to bring their perspective to to this work. So um, thank you, Monica, for sharing that, and um, I'll thank Jeremy in advance. Uh, one last item I wanted to add to uh, this area is just an update on our uh, the safe parking programs up at the Armory. <coughs> Sorry. So our Tier Three program uh, at the Armory opened August twenty second uh, August in uh, this year. Uh, that is a program with the free guide as the operator uh, in partnership with the Association of Faith Communities. Uh, the program quickly filled up. Uh, it's a capacity of 16 participants, um, 16 vehicles, um, and a total of 26 participants. Um, in addition to filling up to capacity almost immediately, there's an extensive wait list. Again, this is a 24-7 program for extended period of time that's providing case management, service connection, and also doing housing navigation and problem solving. Um, and so this program has been very successful, I think, in getting to capacity. It's still early, and so there's not really uh, housing outcomes yet to be able to communicate. Uh, but in terms of participation and interest and demand for the services uh, has been really robust. And, um, and uh, our, our contractor, uh, Free Guide, and Association of Faith Communities are doing tremendous work. Uh, the fourth action area of care and stewardship, uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the rehousing focused service coordination. This also speaks to the collaboration and partnership that uh, has been built over the last year with the county and our other community partners. As I reported at the last quarterly update back in August, um, we talked about uh, the collaboration that was established to try to expand case management, service connections, and rehousing efforts for persons camping in the bench lands as we went through uh, the closure process of that camp. Uh, city and county staff, along with our community partners, met weekly um, back beginning back in July and continued that work through the closure process, uh, working to coordinate, align, and augment the services that were provided um, in the camp. Uh, it began with the city outreach team conducting a census of uh, everybody in the camp um, that was willing to provide their information, getting that information into the outreach module of the uh, HMIS uh, that really became a platform for being able to share information across agencies. And so that was really successful. Um, this past quarter, as we wrapped up the closure of the camp, the focus has shifted for this group. And so uh, the service coordination that was established continues. Uh, we've invited different partners now that the focus um, uh, has shifted. Uh, the relationships uh, and connections that were established with case managers and other service providers when people were in, in the encampment have followed them to those who took shelter up at the City Overlook or 1220. So we've maintained those service relationships with uh, our partner agencies. And we're continuing to have now twice a month meetings with this new uh, team of collaborative service coordination, which again we're referring to as rehousing focused service coordination, uh, that is really trying to focus on case management, um, and problem-solving housing navigation. So it's really kind of a case review to ensure coordination alignment. But that collaboration that was built uh, through that process is ongoing, and we anticipate it continuing um, as an effective method to coordinate our work and be um, effective in how we're serving our unhoused community and building connections towards uh, housing. Uh, also in this area, just a, a quick update on progress towards uh, building a mobile crisis response team. Uh, we've initiated the process, um, engaged with a consultant to do essentially the feasibility and needs assessment. Uh, this model is, uh, you know, 
designed to provide an alternative response to law enforcement response uh, for those requests for service that are non-criminal and non-emergency in nature. Uh, the model operates uh, really in two-person teams with a crisis intervention worker that's skilled in counseling and de-escalation, um, as well as a medic, such as an EMT or a nurse, um, that can respond to a broad range of situations. Uh, those of you who are familiar, it's, this is kind of a cahoots style kind of model that's in operation in several jurisdictions across the country and across the state. Um, and so we've engaged a uh, consultant in this first phase of feasibility and needs assessment, um, and they'll have a, a report completed uh, in February is what we're anticipating. And then a second phase of work would involve supporting operational and, and service implementation based off of that. Uh, over the last quarter, a significant lift um, for the city related to homeless response uh, was the San, San Lorenzo Park Restoration Project and the, this first phase of the bench lands camp, encampment closure. Uh, the goals of this project were to relocate people living in the bench lands to safer places with access to better services, uh, to return the park uh, to a safe and usable public open space, uh, and then thirdly, to restore the park's local habitat for environmental and flood protection. Uh, the encampment closure phase uh, was completed in the first week of November. Uh, the city provided an alternative shelter option to um, everyone who was interested in shelter. Uh, through that process, 39% of the people who had been living in uh, that encampment accepted an offer to a city shelter. Um, now, this does not include uh, placements in other shelters, which we know there are some, but don't have a complete number. Again, as we're building kind of the data integration, um, we're getting a better handle on data, but this is strictly for this, our numbers going through the phase closure process. And overall, through that process, 170 people connected with um, a better uh, shelter or safe sleeping site and are moving on a path towards more stable housing. Um, and at this time, I would like to turn the presentation over to my colleague, Jeremy Leonard. Larry, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. I'm honored to be here today to highlight some of the successes and hardships that our homeless response team has seen over the past two years. I appreciate you taking your time uh, to listen to these boots on the ground experiences that we've had. My name is Jeremy Leonard. I'm a longtime Santa Cruz small business owner. And I'm working with, I, I, I've been working with houses folks in Santa Cruz for over 10 years. Previously, I was a case manager at Housing Matters, working with families as well as assisting people with obtaining housing under a rapid rehousing grant. I worked for the county as part of the management team for the Benchlands Managed Camp and later the Gulf Lands uh, up at the Armory Complex. I've been providing direct services in the San Lorenzo Park for three years. I imagine there isn't one person listening to this report whose life hasn't been touched by substance use in one way or another. Nationally, our streets are being ravaged by fentanyl, and Santa Cruz is no different. From what I've witnessed while working in the bench lens, the negative impacts of substance use, coupled with varying degrees of mental illness, greatly impact many of our houseless neighbors. <coughs> Over time, as the camp became more entrenched, I saw peripheral issues develop around substance use, which caused the most vulnerable to become victims of violent crime. Uh, these crimes generally go unreported to authorities. The social environment and the ease of access to fentanyl in the streets make it difficult for service providers to operate and find success with referring people to various services. Couple all of that with high cost of living, lack of affordable housing, and we have the situation that we see playing out on the streets. In conjunction with our city partners, our outreach team was able to advocate for and refer hundreds of people to mental health services, medical health services, drug treatment, and assistance with obtaining benefits and placement into shelters and SLEs, sober living environments. We work very closely with the incredible staff at HPHP, Housing Matters, Downtown Outreach Workers, Downtown Streets Team, Social Workers, and Service Providers countywide and beyond 
We get a lot of call from, from mental health workers from, from all over surrounding counties, uh, often on our outreach phone. Uh, to me personally, the most satisfying assistance that we provided on the streets of Santa Cruz is successfully reunite, uh, reuniting estranged families. We would often run across parents wandering the Benchlands looking for their missing children. Outreach team, our outreach team uh, receive call, receives calls almost daily from people looking to connect with lost family members. We assist willing parties with reunification and attachment to mental health services, counseling, substance use treatment, and all kinds of other services. I would like to take this opportunity to specifically highlight one of the many positive outcomes that our team experienced and one that hit me especially hard. Over the course of the time the, of our time in the bench lens, our team intervened in nearly 50 overdoses. In the afternoon of one of our normal stints in the bench lens, we heard a com commotion and a call for Narcan from a nearby tent. After gaining entry, we found a person unresponsive and immediately administered two doses of Narcan. We called EMS. I could not detect a pulse, so I began CPR, and after about 10 minutes, the per person regained consciousness just as EMS arrived. They were taken to the hospital and made a full recovery. In my experience, people are often hesitant to go with EMS after an OD, so we stand by and encourage them to avoid recurrence of an overdose. Uh, we also make ourselves available after the fact to help people navigate substance use uh, treatment options that we have available to us. Uh, the next day, the person found our team in the bench lens, thanked us, and asked us if we could get uh, help getting referral to drug treatment, which we did. We contacted our county partner, Rayanne Jimenez, who is a gem of this community. She works really hard with the folks on the street, um, and she referred, referred this person to substance use treatment, and they were admitted. Fast forward four months, I was walking down next to the county building. I was just kind of lost in my thoughts, just walking down on my way to the bench lens. And I heard a voice call out from, from behind me, hey, Jeremy, hey, how's it going? And I, I mean, people call our names all, all day long, right? So I, I turned around, and uh, they said they wanted to hug the person that saved their life. We had a nice conversation, and they told me that they had been clean and sober for 90 days, living in an SLD, SLE, and regained employment. Due to our trauma-informed approach and consistent outreach, this person trusted our team and was able to reach out and ask for the help that they needed. From my experience, left unchecked, people in active fentanyl use don't often recognize that they have a problem, which can lead down a very dark path. These issues don't just affect the user and their families and friends, they affect the health and well-being of our entire community. They negatively impact the ecology of our wildlands and our watersheds and the natural beauty of Santa Cruz that we all care about. By providing access to treatment, support, and coordinating access to services, we were able to, uh, and also providing assistance in a shelter, our outreach team has been able to mitigate some of these problems. At the 1220 River Street uh, Transitional Encampment and the City Overlook, we're able to go one step beyond just outreach by offering some stability in what oftentimes is a chaotic lifestyle. This can be a first step in providing access to services that offer intervention into that cycle of addiction um, or other hardships that our participants may be experiencing. At 1220, participants are required to meet regularly with case management and work on their individual service plan with the goal of getting off the streets. I feel that only providing compassionate access to resources while simultaneously holding people accountable will we be able to come up with solutions to this vastly complex issue of houselessness. I really appreciate everybody here listening to uh, our stories. Obviously, we, we care a lot about these things, so, so I really thank you guys. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, our final action area of community safety, some quick updates, just uh, where we're at in the coastal development design permit uh, process related to the oversized vehicle ordinance. Uh, if you recall, at the last update, um, it's uh, making its way through the appeal process. It's on track for de novo hearing with the Coastal Commission. That date has not been set yet by the Coastal Commission. Their next meeting uh, is not until uh, February of 2023, so that would be the earliest it would be heard. Uh, coordinated outreach and response. Uh, again, I've talked a little bit about um, the integrated approach to doing this work. Um, rather than doing it in silos with individual departments. Uh, 
So during this quarter, the Santa Cruz Police Department is dedicated to community service officers to support outreach and encampment response across the city. In addition, I mentioned the new Public Works Field Division uh, that started operation in November. Uh, and these teams are working in tandem with our city outreach staff and other staff in police, fire, and parks to outreach to people experiencing homelessness and support connections to services and available shelter and to clean up and mitigate the impacts of encampments. Uh, and then just a, another quick update um, related to the care court. You know, the governor's proposed uh, care court proposal, SB 1338, was approved by the legislator in, legislature and signed by the governor in September. Uh, this legislation compels people with untreated uh, severe mental health illnesses into housing and treatment. Uh, and counties will have to establish these new courts by December of 2024. Um, there is some additional funding provided by the state to establish the courts, but there is presently no new funding specifically dedicated to support the necessary housing um, and mental health services. And the city will continue to uh, be in conversation and dialogue with the county as local development of CARES court unfolds. Um, and then the last section, just a quick update uh, related to budget and budget planning. Uh, just to recap over the course of this year, um, and included in your uh, agenda packet uh, was a, a expenditure plan related to the costs uh, for the uh, implementation of the Homeless Response Action Plan. Uh, and just to recap, kind of key commitments and investments so far this year include uh, the contract for with the Salvation Army for shelter services up at the Armory. Uh, that's $3.7 million, uh, as well as addition, additional infrastructure costs at the site. Uh, our safe parking tier three contract with AFC Free Guide, which is approximately $400,000. Uh, the cost associated with this, the expanded internal staffing, the, the Public Works Field Division, um, uh, the permanent positions within homelessness response on our outreach team and communication support, uh, the total approximately $1.1 million per year. Um, and then also the capital investment and the purchase of 125 Coral Street, which is integrated and part of the master planning process for expanded services there. Uh, since the last quarterly update, uh, the only significant budget modification uh, is the reallocation of $1 million from the Hygiene Bay remodel from the California 14 million uh, to the Benchlands restoration. So that was council action on August 23rd. Again, that was made possible as well because uh, the funding source for the hygiene being remodel will be the ARPA funds. So uh, we dedicated $1 million of that to the Benchlands um, uh, restoration. Uh, we're in the process now of beginning the budget planning process for next fiscal year. Uh, staff is developing a list of priority projects and the associated costs for different budget scenarios, both for current, uh, continuing current programs uh, such as our expanded shelter and safe parking programs, uh, as well as potential new, new services, whether this is a mobile crisis response uh, program or additional uh, shelter expansion. Uh, and of course, uh, fiscal sustainability is one of the key issues, as um, you are all aware. The programming that we've been, been able to implement this year relies on one-time funding, and so staff continues to explore uh, opportunities for additional funding and is engaged in conversations with state officials on the need for ongoing sustainable funding. Um, and that program programs for next year are, are gonna really require new and additional revenue. So that completes um, our presentation. And at this time, I welcome any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation and those updates, it was, really uh, clear uh, that we have, I know already our team cares and works hard. Uh, thank you for joining us, Jeremy and Monica, today for this update. Um, excellent, excellent presentations that you provided and shared with us. I think um, it's really important to you know, have those perspectives as you are boots on the ground every day. 
connecting, and I'm so happy we've made these positions available in our city staff. And um, I can't see who's behind this. Hi, okay, Susie, there's our, our team, Susie and Megan and Larry. Thank you for providing each of the categories um, of updates. I know there's a lot of um, elements to the plan and that we've worked really hard over the year to um, have all those moving parts in motion and um, structure in place. And I think we've laid a really great foundation. Um, so thank you for really bringing up some specific um, um, accomplishments this year and I will open it up to questions but I have one question um, hey, Rob, okay. where, what zone are you in what zone are you in that um, There's a couple. Uh, we have huh? fire chief Odie so you're right um, if you can mute yourself please thank you <laughs> So my question, I just made a note, um, and we, uh, there were a couple things brought up. One, more housing stabilization support, um, and then my second question, funds um, on the eviction efforts. So on the housing stabilization support, is that part of the plan moving forward? Will we have an update? Uh, how is that implemented in in our plans moving forward to have more housing stabilization support? Is that in the different types of housing that we're working towards? Do you have anything specific yet, or is that still in discussion? So our efforts with if housing stabilization, um, are you talking about uh, persons who are currently in housing, um, but that at risk of? Um, yes. Right. So yeah, right now our principal effort uh, in our plan is, um, the one element is the eviction prevention. That is part of that, uh, is really our principal focus on uh, maintaining um, current housing. Most of our efforts and our energy this year have been really on trying to expand shelter capacity and service connection and working on rehousing efforts, um, more so than investments in housing stabilization. Okay, I'm, I'm curious and thinking about uh, and I, our housing element and as we work on that and moving forward, I see an opportunity of connecting with this team on some of the needs that maybe could be implemented in that. Um, and the uh, funding, let me see, does that roll over even though it wasn't all used? Is that still available for Community Action Board for eviction prevention? They still have that. There's no restrictions on time. Right. Correct. Um, I can't speak to exactly. Uh, the contract was developed with economic development on existing contracts, so I'm not sure what the contract period is. Uh, but there's not a there's not a uh, timeline for that to expire. That I think Great. it's beyond when they'll be able to use it all. Great. I'm happy to hear that so much of it was used and able to provide assistance. I think you said 40 families. Yeah. yeah. So far, as of I think it was November 30th was the report date that we okay. got that there had been 40 Wonderful. families served. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have Council Member Myers, Vice Mayor Watkins, and then Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and Council Member Golder. Do you want just questions or comments? <laughs> and so Council Member Cumming. Yeah. Um, at this time, yeah, if you want to do questions, comments, yeah. and then we can go to public comment. Public comment, yeah, I'll make it short. Um, I just want to thank um, Larry and your team and also Matt's leadership and really the cross-departmental approach that's happened. I, I think since my time on the council, these large encampments um, have, uh, you know, I don't think we've actually closed one without getting a court order to stop partway through. And so I want to recognize that 
you know, the methods that you were able to put together with the uh, incident command and, and really humanize the issue and have staff there on the ground that could go out and actually try to get to understand the folks in the camp is, um, seems to be a worthwhile and effective way to try to address some of these individuals um, and families, frankly, um, situations. Um, so I just wanna recognize that that's in the last four years, um, that's never happened before. So I think that that is a sign that we, um, we did something very well. We did it with compassion and we're able to, to, to not only on top of that, but then to also provide the services as well as um, some of the numbers we've gotten are pretty impressive today. So um, just wanna thank everyone for that. And um, the one key part that seems to be um, not only the building the relationship with the county, which I think will be very important as we move ahead and we wanna make sure that um, resources that you know may not come to the city, we were able to get this one-time investment, but much of this money goes through the county. And so really help having that relationship with the county and um, making sure that folks bring home the resources to this little town and this little community is gonna be really important moving ahead. Um, I don't think we wanna go backwards from the places that you've gotten us to in this last year okay. and a half. So um, that would be tragic. That would be, that would not be a good, um, a good benchmark to, to work back from. Um, so the, I think one of the key things that's different than what we've done before besides the, the actual specific people that are doing this work every single day and developing those relationships and compliments to Monica and Jeremy. You know, I, I went out with you one day in particular and um, you know, it's, you're really doing the work that very, very few people in our society want to do and you're making a difference in people's lives and you do it with compassion and humor. And um, you know, you just are just the coolest two people I got to walk around with for an afternoon. So I admire you greatly and thank you for the work you do. The key thing that also I just really wanna mention is this, this access to the homeless ma management information system. Right. I think Monica, you, you brought this up my mentor in trying to f understand homelessness and the way that we potentially could manage it as a small city brought this up too. And this is like a pivotal piece of the puzzle in that we now have access to put individuals into that system if, if they're willing and you're able to do it. And that gets us data that we've never had before as a small city. And in a small city that doesn't have the funding to solve this issue, um, that data will become invaluable as we move forward. So you know, making sure that never slips back through the cracks ever again, and that we look at that data source as a way to really, you know, make this program work <laughs> is really important. So I'm just thrilled that we were able to get, I know it was actually a little bit difficult to get access. The county initially did not see a pathway to that, but with persistence, we were able to do that. And I think that's just a key part of this um, homeless uh, approach that we've developed over the last year and a half. So. Just want to mostly thank you. Um, I have one question. Um, how many sleeping cabins potentially there at Housing Matters? I'm sorry, can you? How many sleeping cabins might be there at, at Housing Matters? That, at that particular site, approximately 30, and then that is uh, the funding uh, that the county has available to support services related to that. So that would be the capacity there. And my other question is, do we actually have like licensed um, or what is, how do we get access to the HMIS? Do we have to, do our outreach workers have to have particular qualifications? I'm just curious how that all works or did we just get the magic code and we started entering things? I, I can answer that question. So uh, the county uh, beholds the licenses to HMIS and so they have, uh, I, I don't know how their funding works for that uh, but they hold the license and then they are the ones who can distribute the license to other agencies. Yeah. Great. And do we have to renew those every year? I mean, it, or does it just assume that we'll be able to keep using the system? I don't know if we have to renew them. Um, for those of us who do have access to HMIS, there are different trainings that we do need to um, maintain uh, in order to keep our license and to make sure that we are in compliance. Thank you. 
that's my comments and questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Vice Mayor Watkins. Yeah, I just want to, you know, thank you not only for your presentation today, but for the work you do day in and day out. And I really appreciate your sharing your stories because we see the numbers and the figures and it is heartening to know that we're seeing success and the connection to the to the everyday experience of those individuals is so critical and the work that you do is essential. I hope that you all also are able to have self-care and I think that's really important in terms of just your ability to to show up in the way that you need to show up when people are living their lives in uh, in crisis. So that's just my my hope and ask for you to for Matt to ensure that you all get what you need to be able to do the work that you do because it's really challenging. And I ran into Megan, you know, just the other day and she was off to pick up somebody's keys to get their car and I just know that you're you're in the trenches and we're really lucky to have you. Um, I want to thank you for the report, and I, I guess my only question or suggestion or comment is in regards to sustainability and the shifts around reimbursement from Medicare or Medi-Cal, it is Medi-Cal, cal -Aim, right? cal, -Aim. cal -Aim shift. I'm wondering as we look forward in terms of the work that you're doing, which is direct client work, which essentially should be reimbursable at some point, how we can kind of think about building a model out like that. Um, to, to be able to sustain the work. I know it comes with additional, you know, documentation, right, and work, but it is also a way to get money for the work that you are doing. And so, um, anyways, I, I just kind of a thought in regards to the sustainability options. I appreciate that suggestion. Yeah, we've been started conversations, obviously, with the county talking about CalAIM and other things, so we can explore kind of what it would look like and require to, to see if there's a reimbursement opportunity with some practice shift. Yeah, I think that's actually probably a really viable <coughs> option since so much is happening. So, however, I offer. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Well, I'd also like to echo what my colleagues have said and thank you all. Thank you for the presentation and the report. Um, thank you for always being responsive when I email you all and ask questions. Um, and Monica and Jeremy, I mean, the work you do is so incredible. Um, thank you for graciously offering some of your time and showing me the programs that we've stood up and walking me through the bench lands and sharing your stories with me. Um, I think I shared with you that my first job out of college was in the Tenderloin. And um, to see the work being done here in our community, the way it's being done, is um, it's heartening, as my colleagues have said. Um, I have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. Um, do you, do you, uh, in your work, in your outreach work, do you come, do you come across the Tate population, transition age youth population, and if so, are you already connected with the Youth Homeless Demonstration Program? So we do uh, definitely come across Tay Youth. And one way that we are able to verify other than, you know, just outright asking them, um, if they do provide us with their information, um, we are able to look them up in HMIS. Mm -hmm. And so again, it's that, um, it's crucial to have that type of information to see if they are connected and you can actually see who who in, who connected them in HMIS and have their contact, so who their designated case manager is. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we connect with Encompass um, to connect folks as well. Right, well, and as Councilmember Myers said, I mean, the HMIS, access to HMIS is everything. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question is around the pallet shelter. So I understand that there's um, some work that needs to be done on the Coral Street campus and the Hygiene Bay before we bring in the pallet sh shelters, but as we know, things are taking a long time. So how have you considered that in the timeline? Have we ordered them? Sort of what, what's the nitty gritty there? Yeah, so we're in the process of putting together an RFP for those. The timeline is the decision was made to wait to try to get that up and running until the hygiene bay was completed. There's a, as you all are probably aware, there's a series of construction projects that are coming and underway at the Coral Street campus. So 
Uh, we're anticipating that. We're working in conversation with Housing Matters in the county to get the particular parameters for that site, since that site is located, and to make sure, since it's a collaborative venture, in terms of what kind of the requirements for those particular structures, whether they're pallet or something else. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're dialing that, dialing that in, and we'll do an RFP specifically for that site is the plan, uh, and work to be able to have that process complete so that when construction's complete um, on the other part of the campus, um, we can move forward with the demolition and then um, have the uh, shelters available to begin uh, operations as soon as we can. Would it be the case that we have funds for additional pallet shelters that wouldn't fit into that site? And so we find other sites, either inside or outside the city, um, Conceivably, yes, yeah, and so we've allocated a uh, million dollars for the procurement of mm -hmm. these, you know, individual sleeping structures uh, to be able to do that. So there's a variety of ways to configure. So based off of what the right product is for that project, uh, we'll still have uh, resources available for potential other sites. And whether we use that to uh, have shelters at 1220 or up at the armory or if there's a new location that's a new possibility we have that flexibility great so we'll, let's continue to talk because I think there's some um, interest with our county colleagues to offer our, and find some other sites um, it, similarly to vice mayor Watkins I've been thinking about sustainability and how we can continue these and Calame was something I was going to bring up as well the county has I believe already embarked on implementation and rollout of CalAIM. So I think, I think we're in those conversations. And if, when and if we are, let's, let's think about our homeless response as part of that equation. Um, the Watsonville Community Hospital, I think there's an opportunity there as we think about facility and services. Um, and obviously, the Paro Valley um, Hospital District as well. And then the... Um, the uh, healthcare field just released the community health needs assessment that happens every three years, and not surprisingly, homelessness is one of their top goal areas. So I think there's an opportunity there with the work that the area hospitals are doing as well. Um, and then just, you know, the infrastructure that we've stood up is incredible. Um, I haven't seen it either in, in the years that I've been here in Santa Cruz. And um, as we know, health and human services is the role and task and expertise of the county. So as we continue to design and move forward, I hope that we are still and can be doing the infrastructure and more and more ask and invite that partnership, a deeper partnership for the services to be managed and provided by the county. So those are my comments and just really, really grateful for all of your work. Thank you, council member. Appreciate those suggestions. And council member, Kalantari Johnson, if I may, re just respond to the, the piece around sustainability. So I do think, uh, you know, the work that the team has highlighted today really underscores what we can accomplish when we have resources. Uh, we've made some tremendous progress this year, um, and much of the work that we've been able to stand up is vulnerable without sustainable funding streams. So we have been pursuing that on several fronts. Uh, we've re-engaged with Senator Laird and his staff to explore options. We <laughs> Um, have done some outreach to, to the other cities and city managers in the region to talk about increasing our uh, collective jurisdictional contributions towards shelters specifically. Um, and over the course of the next year, as we move into budget season, we're going to be exploring other potential additional revenue opportunities as well. So as Larry uh, and the team highlighted today, it's something that's certainly on our radar uh, with more work to come. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Golder. I won't echo what everybody else said, but I just do want to, you know, express my sincere gratitude for all of the work that you do and for coming today to share with us um, some of that. I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to try and whittle down to the important ones since I know we're trying to not rush or we're not trying to extend the meeting. Um, but one of these came to me in an email um, a couple weeks ago, and then it got brought up here as somebody was asking about for those permanent supportive housing and, and other low income deed restricted units, the ones that are being built at like PAC Station South and those, how are we, or how, who, how is it being selected? Who gets to live there? Are those members of our community or can people from around, you know, the nation put their name on those wait lists? That was one question. Um, can I defer that question to, uh, is if Lee Butler is watching or if Matt 
can chime in. Yeah, I appreciate the question. I, I'm sure Lee and even Bonnie Lipscomb, uh, who oversees our housing team, could also speak to that. But it's typically managed uh, in concert with the housing authority and our nonprofit housing partner. Um, and I know uh, Mayor Bruner, who's been on the Housing Authority Board uh, for many years, can, can uh, has some experience with it as well. Uh, you want to chime in, Lee? No, uh, Bonnie's team, um, oftentimes our economic development team, I should say, um, uh, will oftentimes provide the um, links. Depending on the project, it may be privately managed, and those are uh, connections that our economic development team makes to the individual um, developers who oftentimes um, have a, a separate party who is managing that um, that eligibility process. And sometimes that's housing authorities, sometimes um, they're doing things on their own. So, um, and and there are limitations to your one question, Council Member Golder, there are limitations on um, the, um, the screening of individuals in terms of um, whether or not we can focus on people that are living or working in the county or uh, teachers or artists. Um, you know, we do try to um, uh, to make those um, prioritizations when we can, but depending on the funding streams, um, sometimes the, the federal laws um, don't allow us to, to make any of those preferential uh, treatments. Is there a way that when these wait lists start to open up, that we can get the word out to people in the local community so that if it is available to anyone in the world, that our local community at least knows when and where to apply as these housing projects come online? Um, I know that that does happen, uh, Council Member Golder, and um, I don't see Bonnie Lipscomb uh, on the call, but I do know in past conversations that through that work, the, that local advertising of those opportunities, what often does happen is the vast majority of those units do get filled by local residents. And so that's that's just been their past experience. And as uh, we have some of these other exciting projects come online, that's that's work that we will continue to, to promote here locally. Okay, so my next question I think would be for Jeremy and Monica or people down in the um, encampments is, because um, I know one day when I was down there with you, I saw a few kids. What's the status on the kids living in these conditions and um, how are you like helping them ensure that their kids are enrolled in, in attending school? Yeah, great question. Um, there was one case in Santa Cruz where we were dealing with uh, a group of, of, of family. Um, it, it took a ton of resources. Uh, we were able to get them into uh, a really nice shelter. I, I'm being a little vague, um, but they are no longer living on the street. They are under case management support. Um, they are attending school. Uh, as of right now so yeah we were able we focused a lot of energy on that because obviously we don't want children living on the streets of our city and so is it is it is there so uh, you you're so you're saying that when you do encounter children and families those are your highest priorities still and it's our highest the priority best thank Indeed, you for that totally. thank you that's yeah. really important to get families out of poverty yeah absolutely i i was a sixth grade science teacher for a while so i have uh you know especially a, a connection with the, the kids and and uh it, it is our top top priority and then i really appreciate jeremy you bringing up um you know the fentanyl and the and the drug um substance abuse um or you know addiction issues that are happening and i'm wondering this is to everybody is there ways that we can reach out and advocate for help and support around that federally or at the state level, because it's really, you know, impacting people in our encampments, but also even I've heard of kids getting it in pot that they buy off the street. You know, it's like, it's really scary. And then um, with all my opportunities to sit in court lately, I've been seeing failure to appeal, failure to appeal, failure to appear. And it's, it's a lot of drug related, you know, uh, distribution and I, I don't, I don't know what the answer is, obviously, but if there's ways we can advocate and address like how much that is a large contributing factor, factor to this. In a, you know, it's like we, we all know there's the housing crisis, but I think there's also a drug crisis yeah. and a mental health crisis that are, are, are equally as important. And I don't know, I don't know if I have a specific question or if you have comments about that, anybody. <laughs> Yeah, Council Member Golder, I, I think we can absolutely continue to engage and advocate on that front. Uh, there's been some recent articles talking about the ways in which it's impacting 
our county alone, and this is playing out all, all over the country, we are facing an epidemic and it, it's hitting our youth and families the hardest. Um, and Santa Cruz is not immune to that. So there's work we can continue uh, doing together. And of course, you know, Jeremy and Monica's experience out there um, on the street every day uh, is powerful, as we all saw today. So um, we'll continue working on that. And then I just have one other request, and I think this would probably be for Matt. Remember the presentation we got last time in regards to if we didn't do anything about the water, this is the financial impact. I'm wondering now that we're doing some work around homelessness that we haven't done before, if there's a way to kind of quantify that in, in saying like the money we've saved in cleanups and 911 calls and theft and a, you know loss of tourism revenue or whatever, because although people want to say we're wasting money and this is the county's work and we shouldn't be doing it, and I'm not saying that anyone's saying that, but I've kind of heard that you know in the community, I just want to acknowledge that although we're investing in 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 these individuals to do this really important work, it's actually saving money. I don't know if that's something we can do in the future. We have modeled some of that, uh, and in future updates, we can bring back uh, how we're quantifying the positive benefits of investing in solutions rather than chasing after the impacts associated with homelessness. Uh, so absolutely, we can bring more information around that. The team has also been building out a model around what the cost would be to really um, fully resource the team. So we've made some good work over the last year standing up our organizational capacity, as Larry described today. There's still more work to be done there, and so as we as we build out that team and reach what you know the ideal structure would look like, uh, those will be conversations we bring forward to the council in the future. And then my final comment or suggestion is: I know the the school um, bond just passed, and with that, there's going to be renovations at the school sites. And last year, they removed seven portables from my campus at Bayview, and Pajaro got some of them, and a couple of them just went to the landfill, and they were still perfectly usable. They were 20 years old buildings, right? And this district was just giving them away. All you had to do was pay to get it hauled off. I know Galt's doing renovations this summer. They'll probably be hauling away some free buildings that would have, um, you know, it wouldn't be suitable for a restroom, but it could be, it's better than a pallet shelter because it's insulated, it has HVAC and plumbing. That's certainly something we would be open to. Uh, we're exploring all options at this point. Uh, what I would add to that too, though, is often the, the, the largest hurdle we have is finding locations. Right. <laughs> Um, and so we're, we're continuing to work on that as well, um, as Larry mentioned earlier, and looking for those other options. But yeah, happy to explore that. Thank you again. Thank you, Council Member Golder. I have uh, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. First, I just want to thank all the staff for their hard work on this issue. Um, you know, over the past four years, we've seen a lot of different types of proposals come forward around transitional encampments, and those have been either not implemented or implemented in various different forms. But I think one of the best things that we've seen is a number of different um, types of services that we've been able to offer, whether it was VFW halls, hotels, transitional encampments, 1220. We've been trying a lot, and I think we're getting to a point where we, we now see what is successful and what we're able to implement that's really gonna have the greatest amount of positive impact. So I just wanna thank you all for you know, being the force that's out there that's trying out all these different kinds of models and helping us figure out what's gonna work for our community. And um, you know, we haven't always agreed on how to get there, but I think you know, this uh, council and I think all councils that have come before us have really cared about this issue and wanted to see us do the most positive impact for people who are struggling. I, and I wanted to add too, um, he couldn't be with us, but we have Chris Monteith on our team as well and uh, wanted to acknowledge him as well. I'm sorry, we didn't, we didn't name him and he's an integral part of our team. It's a three person team. Thank yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say that I think that, you know, because of where we are today and, and Matt as well for your leadership to take this on that uh, moving forward, we're, we're going to be a lot more successful at getting funding to really um, continue to expand on these programs. Um, the one, so actually Council Member Golder asked a bunch of my questions, so, <laughs> um, so I'm not going to um, take up too much time. I did, however, though, want to ask um, a couple questions related to some of the upcoming developments uh, down at 1220 River Street, or sorry, not 1220, sorry, uh, at Housing Matters. So, you know, one of the things that I've heard consistently from law enforcement and from folks in the community is that when it comes to emergency beds, like we don't have enough, right? So telecare has about 16. Um, just 
doing a little bit of just quick glancing. It looks like River Street had 19, but obviously River Street's not operational anymore. So I'm just wondering how um, those beds that obviously are some of the most needed beds, how are those fitting into these conversations around the you know what we're building out over at Housing Matters and Coral Street? Yeah, thank you for the question, Council Member Cummings. Um, yeah, from the city's perspective, expanding temporary emergency shelter is, is really a priority. It seems within the system that is the space, the place that we have the greatest need um, compared to the capacity. And really, that kind of that step between getting people off the street and into permanent housing, there really is that need. So, as we engage in those kind of collaborative conversations um, around expanding shelter, um, in addition to what we do in terms of, you know, the Overlook and 1220, those, those are emergency and um, crisis shelter. But when we work with our county partners and Housing Matters, um, trying to prioritize that is, Great. is absolutely on our agenda. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, um, Renee asked all my other questions. <laughs> so I think, um, I think that's it for me. I do just want to appreciate as well the um, study coming forward on the um, non-law enforcement uh, emergency crisis or non-emergency crisis response. Um, that's something that people have been asking us about for quite a significant amount of time. And, and I think that moving in that direction, at least, you know, having that study is going to be helpful. And then um, I wasn't able to be here earlier, but uh, the study that was just conducted by the Criminal Justice Council, I think, is definitely worth um, looking at as well, um, where... The, um, the report that just was generated from this year uh, looks, it, it really looked at how many calls are coming in around mental behavioral health and where those people are being kind of diverted to, whether it's criminal or non-criminal, and also the um, sentiments of the mental health liaisons that work with law enforcement officers and their desire to continue working with law enforcement or not. And so I think it's definitely worth um, reading, I think, actually all the council members, I'll, I'll send it out to everyone so that they have it, but um, definitely worth looking at as we kind of move into that realm as well. Thank you. Thank you, council member Cummings. Council, council member Brown? I, my questions have been asked. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but if I could, while I have a moment, I want to say really sincerely thank you. It just doesn't even begin to cover it, but the work that you all do um, engaging with people, boots on the ground, is is so critical, and um, you know, do, does require that you really and that you give it your all in in ways. And so, I want to just highlight or echo um, Vice Mayor Watkins' statement about self care. And I know everybody, we all tell each other, take care of yourself, and you know that sounds great. Um, but I, I, I'm serious, and if there are ways that we can be helpful to you all in trying to make your experience, um, you know, make you feel more supported or whatever it might be, you know, I want to say I'm here, and um, it, it's just so critical what you do, and it is making a huge difference. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Uh, I I would also like to acknowledge uh, City Manager Matt Huffaker because I know it's your responsibility to lead staff and all the departments and teams and this has been huge, monumental undertaking that you jumped into. So thank you so much and I, I just am hoping that we can continue the momentum I know we're all here um, to continue the work forward um, for all of our residents. I'd like to give you the opportunity to say anything. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, for those kind words. And I want to start by just saying that the work that we accomplished this year would not have been possible without the support and leadership of the council as well. I want to thank you all for that. And I would be remiss to not also express my appreciation for the team that's here today. Uh, you all are nothing short of heroes in my book. Uh, you come across some of the most complex, traumatic, challenging um, situations that our society is facing, and you do it with empathy and enthusiasm. It's incredible to see you all greeted when you're out there in the course of your work with smiles uh, amongst folks that are facing some incredible 
challenges. And I wanted to thank you for that. And also not in the room today, our staff from our fire department, police department, parks, parking, public works, um, really across the board, our city attorney's office, uh, Cassie on Tony's team has been a lockstep with our staff all the way through this and wanted to acknowledge the tremendous work underway across all of our departments. I'm incredibly proud of that. And uh, of course, we've got a lot of work still to do ahead of us. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much. Okay, um, I will now take it out to public comment. If you are joining us here in person, you can line up to the right of the dais. If you are joining us virtually, you can now, um, you can raise your hand by dialing star nine on your phone or select the raise hand feature on the webinar. And uh, yeah, the instructions are on the screen. There we go. And I will just look to see, we do have one hand raised. Um, it looks like Reggie Meisler, I'll go ahead and start with you. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, welcome. Hi, um, I just wanna say that it's, it's very nice to hear stories like the couple at 1220 River Street. And it makes me feel heartened that we have such compassionate people working as service providers in our city. I do kind of want to shed some light uh, a bit on what was said. When I heard the story from Monica that the couple before entering River Street Camp struggled <laughs> to live in their vehicle and that much of that struggle was caused by the fear of ticketing and towing, uh, I just think we need to admit that like those were fears that the city caused. They did not need to cause those fears in people, right? And so this is the result of the city treating vehicles that people live in as the same as vehicles that people just use for transportation. And so while I'm glad the city went on to rectify that problem that they caused by helping get this couple into housing and um, help shepherd them in the ways that they needed help, um, I can tell you that for like every story we hear about a couple like this, there are still like hundreds of people who are getting the abuse of law enforcement, but not getting the help into affordable housing. And that's not the fault of Monica or Jeremy, that's a policy failure. And so when we're partnering with the county with, for health and human services, and we're talking about what is fiscally sustainable, the cost of ticketing and towing people who are peacefully using their vehicle as shelter is not just a waste of police labor and money, it is creating an increasing price tag on our overall infrastructure for people because it's increasing the number of unsheltered people. So we have to admit, we have to admit that vehicle shelter <laughs> housing, and it's Thank much, much comment. less expensive than affordable housing. Thank you. Um, our next uh, public comment is, um, it looks like here in person. Hi there, welcome. Hi, our name is Matt Tassel. We're a 37 uh, year resident of the county. Uh, been homeless for the last nine months. We'll not go into the circumstances of that. Um, we'd like to say that the logistics of a coordination of um, what you all are um, giving the kudos to is absolutely been abominable from what our experience has been. Um, we uh, self-referred after we got a letter from Bernie Escalante, you're a victim of a violent crime, and Julie Schneider saying, sorry, can't offer you directly any special shelter for being a victim and the perpetrators living in Harvey West Park along with us and continuing to threaten us. And uh, Schneider's, uh, Solution is called 911, and you don't get cellular reception at Harvey West, even if you have Verizon. People warned us, well, just get the heck out. So we went back into the Poganip as far as we could and mistimed it, and the police towed our car. So we went from having the safety and security of our Volvo wagon with our emotional support animal, a cat, Pip, to being on foot for the last six weeks. Our feet are a wreck. We have just gotten off a IV drip at Dominican for pneumonia. Thank you. 
They're scraping. Housing Matters is scraping for metrics. We told Chloe we have all these letters. Can you please maybe give us a top of the list? Is there any resources for victims of violent crime, emergency shelter? Her advice was come on in. We're going to do an interview. About half we planned, we ch changed our schedule for two days around that interview. We get in there about halfway into the interview. We're like, this does not have anything to do with emergency shelter. What are you talking about? What are these questions? She says, there is no emergency shelter for victims of violent crime in this county. We stood up and said, what are you doing? You know, look, we've got a 4.0 in, in collaborative health and human services with the concentration of nonprofit management at CSUMB. And we know what scraping for metrics looks like when we see it. And we are not a metric, OK? And that's just one of many, many things. The Thank way this is being conducted is disgusting. Is Uh, let's see, does anyone else in person have any comments? Please step forward. Uh, had a wonderful day. This morning I was out looking for some shells. Dropped it, so there's more. Um, I have the... Um, International Society of um, Arbor Culture. And the um, seal of the county of Santa Cruz. And um, I've been permitted by a lead arborist of California. He's not going to be here this fall or winter, so I'm not sure what's going to happen to Later, so hopefully, I don't get stuck in the chipper. And um, Vice Mayor Justin Cummings and Mayor Martine Watkins um, said, To whom this proves, um, one living structure for botany findings. So, um, the research project permit is a national forest. Uh, is now under Santa Cruz County's um, power and control. Um, and I am the International Inland Fish and Wildlife Environmental Technician. I also made a inland harvest report um, for the Natural Resources Department because as part of protocol and becoming uh, like the Russians who conquered the forests. Um, so this is Santa Cruz Studies. It has the seal on it. Um, you just put your information and everything you catch or native plant species you eat, you document for your families. Um, remedies from this uh, apocalypse. Thank you for your comment. Yep. Um, okay, we have received public comment. Um, I don't see any of the other hands virtually, and um, I will bring it back to council. Um, I did have a question. I, I know that, you know, we had some public comment uh, there are, as, as much as we applaud the progress we've made, there are still much to be done. And I see our whole team shaking their head. There are still many gaps that people are falling through. So I hope that, you know, some type of um, emergency shelter situation, um, type of housing for victims of uh, violent crimes can be considered um, in that conversation that we spoke of earlier. Um, and I'm not aware of, um, you know, I know that we have, um, we work with Monarch Services and, you know, they have some options to consider, but I'm sure there are each, each person's situation is unique to them and what they're going through and what their needs are, which makes 
kind of blanket solutions so difficult, but we have to really um, listen to, you know, all of the the scenarios and situations that people ha are going through and really try our best to incorporate um, into our future actions, into our future considerations and making sure that um, less and less people are falling through um, gaps in, in, in systems of care. Um, Council Member Cummings. I did have one more thing I wanted to bring up because it's not directly, um, you know, call out in this report, but you know, recently we've been receiving um, some emails about a situation that's happening um, kind of in the uh, south of Laurel area where a resident who's Section 8 um, had their place red tagged and um, because of a, a water heater and that person ended up getting put back in the homelessness after, you know, being homeless. And, you know, one of the issues that's come up around that whole conversation is that think that based on the city's policy, um, the landlord is supposed to be, you know, paying that person, uh, the, you know, whatever kind of um, relocation. relocation assistance that they need. And I think there may need to be a conversation and to the extent that it's legal that, you know, if a landlord puts a tenant in that kind of situation, maybe that's something that the city would then pay out to the tenant if they're put in that situation since it's our... Um, 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 I can't remember the name of the program, but the rental housing um, code enforcement program that we have. And then the city bills the landlord for that because oftentimes, you know, people who are getting put into homelessness aren't going to be able to find, afford a lawyer to go after a negligent landlord. And so it's just something I think might be worth having the city consider moving forward to address those kinds of situations. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I'll just echo that comment. I've had a conversation with Matt with you about this um, offline, but um, given that we know and we've heard it affirmed that stabilization and keeping people housed is the most effective way and it's the most cost effective way to address these challenges, um, it really does feel like putting more attention in that, in, in that arena would be productive for us, uh, um, as well as the right thing to do. So um, I'm really interested in continuing that conversation as well. And I want to just acknowledge uh, to the gentleman who spoke up, um, if you have particular issues that, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm around, I'm happy to try to talk to help you navigate to the best of my ability through. I know there's staff here, um, and I'm sorry it's you having these kinds of challenges. There are um, certainly... Um, resource uh, limitations and you know other issues and we're trying to figure it out but I want to be involved in making in improving the situation so you can feel free to reach out to me I'm Sandy Brown um, but we sorry we can't have a back and forth right now but I'm happy to talk with you offline okay all right um, that completes uh, I've got sun there we that completes um, our <coughs> quarterly homelessness response update item 35 on our um, I mean 36 on our agenda and um, at this time I, I again would like to say thank you for this update and for um, being here we are now adjourned until oral communications at uh, 420. 4.15. Are we not coming back at 3.30? Uh, that's right. At 3.30, we have a presentation, and at 4.20 is oral communications. And then at 7 p.m. is our evening session with ceremonial presentations. So 3.30 p.m. for a presentation, 4.20, 4.15 for... I don't know why I keep saying 420. <laughs> 415 for oral communications. And oral communications is the time for anybody to speak on items not on today's agenda. So hopefully that was clear. Thank you very much. We will adjourn until 3.30. Okay, we are 
returning from a brief break. We are revisiting our presentation items. We continued agenda item number nine, mayoral proclamation declaring December 13th, 2002 is Ryan Coonerty Day in the city of Santa Cruz. And um, I'd like to welcome Ryan Coonerty um, here. And if you'd like to step forward and I will. So Ryan Coonerty, our District 3 Supervisor, County Supervisor, and I know you've worked with each of us and many city staff over the years. And um, now that you are retiring from your county seat, um, I think it's very fitting to um, have the honor to be able to present this mayoral proclamation. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is so kind of you all to um, have me over and for me to have a chance to say thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure working with all of you. Uh, I got all teary this morning in my speech, so I promise I won't get teary now. But um, I was thinking back, and so 18 years ago this week, I was inaugurated or sworn into city council, and I opened the desk drawer and you know, wrote my name on it and felt totally unqualified to, uh, to be doing so when I looked at the other names that were um, listed there. And as I think back on 18 years uh, in local government, um, what I'm struck by is how good the people are. And uh, I've been so lucky to work with all of you with a city staff um, that is really uh, special. I don't think people uh, appreciate until you've been in the positions that you all have been in. Um, how good people are and how committed people are to making this work even under the most difficult and trying of times. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm here just with gratitude for you all and the work that you've done uh, over these last few difficult years. Um, and I got to say, like, I'm more optimistic about the city of Santa Cruz today than I was 18 years ago. Um, in, because of the efforts that you all have made. Um, and <clears throat> I'm not going anywhere, and I like to contribute and help in any way I can, um, but I really look forward to seeing um, everyone else uh, take, up the, take up these positions, uh, make the hard decisions, and move our community forward. And I'm just, um, I'm great that I appreciate, I know you all have a very busy calendar today, and so I, I'm really grateful that you all take the to take the time to uh, to to to, make, to honor me and um, my family and I are very grateful. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. You're not done yet. So I am going to read the proclamation. <laughs> okay. Um, I think there's a lot of good information that needs to be shared and stated and recognized. Whereas Ryan Coonerty was born and raised in Santa Cruz, where his family's civic engagement and downtown business taught him the value of serving his community and influenced his later vision as a public servant that government should be an instrument to improve the lives of its citizens. And whereas Ryan Coonerty was first elected to the Santa Cruz City Council in 2004 at age 30, where he served two terms and was a two-time mayor. And whereas, as mayor and council member, Ryan Coonerty led a successful effort to reach a historic agreement between the city and the University of California at Santa Cruz, UCSC, pushed the city to invest its reserve funds back into the community, authored the city's Clean Oceans, Rivers, and Beaches initiative, and played a key role in attracting the Santa Cruz warriors to Santa Cruz. And whereas Ryan Coonerty was elected to the Board of Supervisors in 2014, easily reelected in 2018, and elected as chair of the board in 2019. He has dedicated his eight years of service to investing in youth and established the county's landmark nurse family partnership and the Thrive by Three program, both of which have already proved life changing for dozens of first-time, low-income moms and their babies. And whereas on August 16, 2020, 
our county experienced the most catastrophic fire in over 100 years. During the fire, Ryan Coonerty was in direct and constant communication with constituents throughout the nights and weeks ahead, getting critical and needed communication and services to fire survivors and evacuees and obtaining critical support from state and federal government. And whereas, whether on the Board of Supervisors or City Council, Ryan Coonerty was a tireless advocate for downtown Santa Cruz, advocating for and developing policies to make downtown the vibrant place that it is for Santa Cruz families and visitors alike. And whereas Ryan Coonerty is not one to let the grass grow under his feet, despite the demands of elected work in his spare time, he continued to teach at UCSC, recently earning a fellowship from the University of California National Center for Free Speech, hosts the podcast An Honorable Profession, co-authored the book The Naked Economy, which present presciently <laughs> predicted <laughs> the move to remote work, and wrote for National Geographic, the Los Angeles Times, Irish Central, the San Francisco Chronicle, Governing Magazine, and more. And whereas in addition to politics, teaching, writing, and podcasting, Ryan Coonerty always found time to mentor, advise, and recruit new community members into politics, never closing the doors behind him as we see so often in political life, but rather lending a hand up and making room for newer, younger, and more diverse faces. And whereas after 16 years of elected service to the people of the city and county of Santa Cruz, third district Santa Cruz County Supervisor Ryan Coonerty will be stepping away from elected office. Now therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, mayor of the city of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim December 13th, 2022, as Ryan Coonerty Day in the city of Santa Cruz, and I encourage all citizens to join me in acknowledging his years of dedicated public service and expressing gratitude for the numerous contributions to improving the lives of Santa Cruz citizens and wishing him well in his life after elected office. Thank you. Thank you. like to invite Rachel Dan up please because I know that a lot of your success there's always someone there that is part of that success so I really have to acknowledge Rachel Dan as well Rachel Dan works in Ryan Coonerty's office, and I know in my couple years here at council, I've been in numerous meetings with county, and Rachel is always there. Oftentimes, she's the person if Ryan can't be there because he's at another meeting, Rachel's there. She works equally hard. I want to acknowledge and recognize all the work she contributes to our citizens, our community, and thank you.
Um, just thank you. That's really kind. Uh, my kids will be impressed. Uh, this is like something actually tangible. They get like, wait, like, like I got show them uh, from all their dad's service. But uh, I know a bunch of you are going other places and other uh, those who are staying on and you're welcoming new colleagues. Um, and I just want to, as a resident of this city, thank you all so much for your service. Um, it is not an easy job. And uh, you all have done it with real intelligence and grace and thoughtfulness and concern for our community. And so um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I just, I know um, a couple of council members, I wanted to just give the opportunity if anyone else wanted to say anything. I know a couple of council members are leaving um, council, but um, go ahead and if anyone wants to speak. Okay, council member Myers, council member Kalantari Johnson, vice mayor Watkins, council member Golder. <laughs> Ryan, I see both your kids in your face today, so it's really, I see a sense of relief and a sense of accomplishment and a sense of, um, you know, you just serve your community in such a steadfast, you know, somewhat quiet way. And what I, when I think of the things that you've been through over the last couple of years, it's tough. So, uh, you know, you, you've done a lot for our community and we're gonna miss you. Thank you. And I'm very jealous that you got to interview Mr. Imhoff. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think that we all just, you know, you are, you are truly a mentor for the next generation of leaders here in Santa Cruz. And so thank you for all your work. And thank you to your family, too, Absolutely. <laughs> for sharing you. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. So you took office 18 years ago. I met you 17 years ago at the Chinese restaurant on Mission Street with Mike Rodkin. <laughs> and we talked about how to address binge drinking and underage youth. And you have been a mentor ever since then. Um, I just want to acknowledge everything that you've done for this community, um, for those of us who have shown interest in serving. And this community loves you. Uh, the North Coast loves you. Bonnie Dune loves you. And they love you because you care and you give it your all. So thank you so much. By Vice Mayor Watkins. Gosh, I don't know where to start. Um, I, I, I guess I'll just start by echoing my, my colleagues and friends' comments about you, Ryan, and how grateful I am to call you a friend and also a mentor. I um, would go, oh, when things were going bad, I'd be like, Ryan, you <laughs> brought me into this. <laughs> But you were always there to walk me through, and Rachel as well, and to help me understand how to navigate what's really challenging sometimes and sort of the unspoken elements of the work and the community and, and ultimately how to serve our community um, in the end and, and what public service really means. Um, just today, we had a chance to form our... Um, Cannabis Tax Dollar Childhood Advisory Committee in which Rachel was appointed to serve on. And I don't think I would have known how to navigate getting that in place if it weren't for the two of you. And so your legacy lives beyond your policy actions and choices, but how you influence others' ability to do the same. And I'm really, really, really grateful personally and as a community member and city resident for your really outstanding years of work. So. Thank you. I know this isn't the end. I'm sure we'll be seeing you, um, but that's a really long time of public service. And yeah, thank you so much. Council Member Golder. I too just want to thank you. Um, you've always been a mentor and a friend and a neighbor <laughs> and just how humble and, um, and steadfast and you have a sense of humor and you, you're not ego driven at all. And it's just really, um, it's something I admire because I think oftentimes when you think of politicians, you think of something else. And so just knowing how down to earth you really are and how you really care about the community. And I, I'm excited for your family and your kids that you're going to get some more, you know, time with them and look forward to working with you in the future in whatever capacity to, you know, help, help um, Santa Cruz. Yeah. Thank you. You're my district rep. I so, know. Uh, I like, oh. Unfortunately <laughs> for you. I'm change my phone on her. Just kidding. <laughs> right, Councilmember Cummings and then Councilmember Brown. Um, so I was I was able to call in the meeting earlier, but just wanted to again 
thank you not only for all of your years of service, but um, just, you know, I, th I think, and this is me speaking personally, having served as mayor of this town in 2020, and, you know, when we saw the pandemic approaching, um, it was during an extremely divisive time in our community, and being able to reach out to you and work with you and our other representatives, um, along with Vice Mayor Myers and our council members, I think was an opportunity for us to really demonstrate to our community how we can come together and how we can get past our differences and really work towards make, keeping our community safe and uh, demonstrating true leadership. And that's something that I really appreciated about um, being able to work with you and learn more about you and your perspective on government and the different issues. And um, it's really helped inform a lot of my decision making. And I think that um, you know, moving forward, I'll definitely be building off that leadership and the many programs you've helped create to protect families and increase diversity in our community. And so just want to express my uh, heartfelt thanks for all of your years of uh, dedicated service to this community. And I know that um, you will be out there still. So um, I'm, I'm sure I'll hear from you as, as your representative as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All these people who are now uh, accountable elected officials. Uh, I mean, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's really, really, I appreciate your words and your collaboration during that really challenging time. Councilmember Brown. Well, since everyone's going, I'm going to yeah. uh -huh. pile on here. Um, um, and since uh, Councilmember Calendary Johnson started it out with a, I remember when I'm, I was trying, the whole time I've been trying to remember, and I think I met you um, at the Sea Cloud. We were there with some folks talking about issues related to the third district. Little did probably you know at the time <laughs> where oh. I that. Um, would be serving in that role and uh, we had uh, another third district supervisor at the time we were talking with her and um, I just want to say that um, you know you really you are a true public servant and I won't repeat all the things others have said but you really are a true public servant um, and your commitment to this community is so clear um, and um, you know, you've been thinking about uh, these issues all your life really I imagine and um, you know I just can't wait to see What's up for you next? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, it's been a, yeah, it's been a long time. We were. And here we are. You're retiring. So now I feel old because we were like <laughs> kids yeah. talking about others who were in these roles. And, um, you know, and here we are. So I know. deserve yeah, uh, exactly. a break as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, I'm glad we were able to move this presentation. I know you were in a county supervisor's board meeting today. So I'm glad it all worked out. Um, and that you were able to attend. I'm glad Rachel was able to come. I see your family, your sister, and your dad here. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, making the time. I know it's a crazy day wrapping up all the things at the end of the year, and I, I appreciate the honor. And I'm, I'm truly, truly touched, uh, and, I, and I look forward to partnering with you as a, as a private citizen who, can, who just wants to help his community in any way he can. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it looks like um, we have oral communications at 4.15, so we will take a break until 4.15. Thank you so much. Okay, I will um, just start reading the instructions while the council members return. Is the city clerk ready? I am, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, we are now at the point in the agenda for oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on today's agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you wish to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, 
and you are attending virtually, you can raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raised hand feature in the webinar controls of your computer. You will then have two minutes to speak. Members of the public here in person, if you wish to address the council, you may line up to the right of the dais. You will each have two minutes to speak and we ask that you sign in to ensure correct spelling of your name at the clipboard in the front. However, it's not required. Please remember that oral communications is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we can, we will address questions raised after oral communications. And I see a couple of hands raised, so I will begin with the first member of the public virtually, phone number ending in 1705. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hello, Council, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Hello, hello, Council. Yeah, thanks for taking my comments. My name's Eric Rodberg. I own um, a house at the intersection of Bay and Seaside Streets. And on uh, December 1st, in the early evening, a coyote was hit by a car directly in front of my house. And uh, we called 911, animal control refused to come out. And the coyote wandered into my front yard. It was very badly injured. The next morning we called again and an animal control officer came out and refused to do anything. I called it. I called again, demanded to speak to a supervisor, and they gave me a big runaround and uh, mentioned uh, some volunteer organization, Rebecca, and uh, I asked her her phone number. And in the meantime, it turned out that Rebecca, who has a group in Moss Landing called Wildlife Emergency Services, had gotten an alert the night before on an app, and she was also trying to call and get the information. And eventually, she and her husband, Dwayne, came out they were able to get the injured coyote, which was underneath my house, and it had gotten out, it was in the yard, and uh, transported it to an animal, uh, a, a vet hospital over the hill in San Jose. Uh, this is completely unacceptable. A coyote is a, is a predator, an injured um, predator, could be a danger to kids. This is, a, this is right at the intersection of Bay and Seaside, which is a very, busy crosswalk for Bayview Elementary School uh, and Council Member Golder is the principal. She's aware of the situation. A couple days later in LA, a coyote uh, attacked and took down a two-year-old girl. And and I know this is a county agency. I spoke at the at the county board meeting, but this is really unacceptable. This is the, and, I, and the supervisors didn't respond at all. I would like this addressed. Um, this could be, you know, it could injure or kill little kids. Thank you. Thank you for your, your comment. Um, our next uh, uh, member of the public is um, here in person. Please step forward. Our next contestant, right? Uh, that's terrible about the coyote. Uh, coyotes and dogs uh, share common ancestors, but they're hard to domesticate and treat. I'm not a vet any stretch of your imagination, um, but it is probably a challenge to treat a coyote. Um, they are very gentle animals. Um, uh, it can be. I uh, just wanted to, I want to congratulate uh, Sonia on a wonderful year. I mean, it was uh, prob she's probably the prettiest mayor we've, we've ever had. Um, um, Cynthia Matthews just, and uh, Marty Wormhout, um, just to mention uh, you know, previous mayors who are Handsome. Uh, let's see. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about something a little bit serious. Um, it's about uh, New York City, which is you know far, far away from California and Central Coast of California. But uh, what they've done is they they kind of reverted to something they did when uh, uh, Rudy uh, Giuliani was uh, was uh, mayor, and it's uh, the idea of like uh, abrogating the rights of uh, the homeless. Um, in terms of uh, you know tr treating them as uh, psych patients. Now, okay, you know it, it, there are homeless people who you know have you know comorbidities, uh, you know uh, you know uh, 
medical, you know, uh, med medical issues, mental health issues, or, or drug abuse issues. Um, that doesn't that doesn't mean that they don't have the same uh, they don't have the same guarantees of of uh, rights that that other people do. I um, mean, the Constitution to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So uh, I, d I disagree with Eric Adams' decision. Uh, I, I think it's something that, you know, I mean, we're the two most populous states in the country, in the United States of America. I'm, thanks. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have two more hands raised virtually, so I will bring it to uh, the first hand raised, Reggie Meisler. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, welcome. Hi, um, I just wanted to kind of uh, complete some thoughts that uh, I didn't get to complete earlier. Um, so I think when we're looking at the sort of fiscal sustainability of the current approach to houselessness, which is sort of, um, you know, we go either into tents or we go all the way up into permanent supportive housing and affordable housing. I think the problem with this approach is that the affordable housing numbers that we're getting suggest that building 2,000 units of deeply affordable housing for unsheltered folks would cost over a billion dollars right now because it's at at least $500,000 per unit if we get a really good deal. Um, and I think like not allowing vehicle shelter to be an interim is such a wasteful situation because we could house all 2,000 plus unsheltered people in the county for like $80 million. We could give every single one a cargo van, which is half the price of just one education bond that we did this last election cycle. And city manager Huffaker says the largest uh, hurdle is locations. Vehicles don't need locations. They can just park on streets during the day. And then you can have your safe parking hubs for the night if you want. But just the idea that we have to get locked into this notion of space, I think that's so limiting. And we could really scale if we treated vehicle shelter like real shelter and we could house everyone in that way immediately and continue working on the long-term investments of affordable housing. Um, and I think it's just really unfortunate that we haven't been doing that, but I hope that this helps you guys see kind of the value in getting you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, the next hand raise is the name I am watching you. Go ahead and press star six to unmute. Thank you. Uh, the Cold War here was won by 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed. However, the country then became complacent versus communism and the American communists started a crusade of cultural Marxism, AKA leftism, AKA progressive, using the two fed attack of worming their way into political office or government and also public education, spreading their Marxism 2.0 ideology and not by using Marxist quack class uprising violence, but the Trojan horses of social justice brought racism back with the hypocrisy of anti-racist racism against white people, demoralized and emasculated maleness, rewrote history, created group identity privileged classes and class victims, muzzled what can be said in public discourse, achieving what the Soviets could never do, subjugating America to a totalitarian ideology, destroying America's soul from within. School children's minds, perhaps some of yours, have been groomed with the cultural Marxism poison to create a young, air quote, intelligentsia with ideas like ab abolishing the family, private property, the nation state, individual merit, or God promoted CRT, or false claims of vast systemic racism or white supremacy, and teaching young children to question their sex, possibly by who they now call minor attracted persons. The BLM is a violence-tipped instrument of cultural Marxism. Many progressives may not know they are totalitarian revolutionaries seeking the overthrow of all institutions because as defenseless children, they were mind raped with the new defective ideologies. God help us and the United States. Discrimination is not a solution to racism, but the anti-racist Ibram X. Kendi says it is, quote, the only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. I speak here against all forms of state sanctioned group identity discrimination. 
Um, so I'll, I'll end it there. Thanks. Thank you for your comment. It looks like that concludes uh, our public com our oral communications. Do, are you here for oral communications to speak on anything not on the agenda? Great. Please step forward. Three minutes rather than two minutes. Is I that did, a mistake? I did make a typo, so go ahead with three minutes. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. There's no, no, no problem. Yeah. Well, I know you've been all busy, and uh, uh, you. Uh, thank you for listening to citizens that are coming along. Um, uh, it's the this part of uh, your procedure. I think is a, a very fruitful part because it enhances the communication between citizens and citizens, citizens and the council, and maybe even the council and the council. And. Uh, I, I'm, just as a preface to what else I want to say, I want to say that I was very lucky in being born in Michigan in comfortable circumstances. And at that time, also the state was subsidizing university education. So even I even got there. After that, though, I, I went into the Peace Corps and taught in Ghana for two years. Uh, and from that, I went to Britain for study. And since that time, I've been studying, uh, teaching, uh, having a family, raising children. And in that wide experience of living in various places, what I've discovered is that it seems like democracy works best when enough citizens and elected members of the community as well really lovingly look at each other as fellow human beings capable of uh, learning and having ideas and maybe correcting mistakes that I might have or that you might have. And so this uh, kind of invitation for citizens to speak to you is a very good part of that process and I congratulate you on, on that. However, uh, I would like to make some other suggestions to uh, expand that dialogue promoting mutual respect process, learning and a correction of mistakes. One more minute. One more minute, okay. Uh, now, what, what I had in mind that in addition to you uh, inviting people to do what I'm doing now, I think it would add the, uh, uh, you would be signaling your respect for your fellow citizens uh, in a very clear way if after each person had spoken, one of the members of the council responded at least in one sentence. Thank you very much for doing that, or I've thought of that, I'll think about it later. Uh, uh, that seems difficult, but uh, we'll have to look into the, and reduce some more research, that kind of thing. So there's that sort of two-way communication in the situation. After that, in the meeting, the other suggestion is that when there is a controversial issue that's gonna be voted on later in the meeting, then I think that the, the council should take on the responsibility of each member simply, briefly, explaining their reasoning why they're going to vote either yes or no on the motion. That would, uh, in, it, that would encourage that kind of uh, discussion and transparency. Uh, I just wish you will hope to consider that. It's something that could be done easily, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your sharing your input. That concludes oral communications. I did have a quick question for our city manager um, and our contract with county animal. Do we contract with county animal control? How does that work? And um, just knowing that there have been more and more sightings of coyotes and um, that type of situation, what are, it would be good for, you don't have to respond now, but for us to think about communications out to the public about um, what to do in those situations if animal control is not responding or able to respond to that type of situation, we should have something in place. Um, thank you for the question, Mayor Bruner. That's something we could certainly look into. We are part of a regional animal services joint powers authority, and part of that work includes responding to such calls that were raised uh, this evening. Uh, that's the first I've heard of an uptick with regards to interactions with coyotes specifically. 
uh, but that's certainly something we could run to ground and, and ensure that um, there's a timely response to those requests. Thank you so much. And um, also just um, in, in response to um, some suggestions that were brought up in oral communications, um, I received uh, those same suggestions via email. I'm happy um, to share with the council members as well that um, we'll be here um, going forward, as well as with our new mayor, who will um, be sworn in this evening, and who will be setting agenda and process. Uh, Council Member Brown. I just wanted to say thank you for that. I do hope that we can continue to think about this. Sometimes having been out there and been a someone who's addressing council or other elected bodies, and sitting here, there's this sense of, you know, it just goes into the void and we don't really know what wh where we're going to go with it. So I do think that thinking that about that more and how to be responsive is a great idea. Thanks. And thank you, Council Member Brown. I know it's a very formal process. So, um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, at this time, we will, that completes oral communications. We will adjourn until our 7 p.m. evening session. If you'd like to join us here at 7 p.m., we will have um, our presentations, remarks from outgoing council members, uh, remarks from outgoing mayor, and swearing in and seating of newly elected mayor and council members. Um, so please join us at 7 p.m. for our evening session. Thank you. Okay, good, mo good, ap good evening. <laughs> We've been here since 9.30 this morning. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to our 7 p.m. session of the December 13th, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. At this time, I'd like to ask the clerk to please take roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson, present. Holder. Here. Councilmember Cummings. Here. Brown, here. Councilmember Myers, here. <coughs> Vice Mayor Watkins, here. And Mayor Brunner. Present, thank you. Next on our agenda are our ceremonial presentation items. This portion of the meeting is a time for our outgoing council members to say a few words. I will also be making my outgoing mayor remarks, and then I will turn it over to our lovely city clerk to swear in our new mayor and council members. At this time, I will jump right in and call on council member Justin Cummings and then Donna Myers to make their outgoing remarks. After your remarks, please get up from the dais. And <laughs> We can laugh. I, I, I didn't mean it to sound that way. <laughs> but you may join uh, the audience uh, after your remarks, so thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings. All right, I guess I'll keep it short then. <laughs> um, well, good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us um, as we transition to the next iteration of the Santa Cruz City Council. In 2017, um, I went to an Affordable Housing Week meeting across the street at the Civic. And uh, I went down there because I had a lot of friends in this community who were unable to afford to live here or their rents were getting increased and they were having to move away. These are people who were uh, locals, grad students, people who've lived in their homes for long periods of time. And I wanted to start getting involved. Um, and there was somebody standing outside of the Civic with an email list and asked me if I wanted to sign up to learn more about rent control. And that, I never thought that that single evening going down to that meeting would have such a profound impact on my life because it was that, it was showing up to one of these meetings uh, on affordable housing that engaged me in civic activity and what drove me and motivated me to run for city council. Uh, these past four years have been incredible, to say the least. 
Um, learned a lot more than I thought I'd ever learn about the city of Santa Cruz. Um, I've seen us come together in really extremely difficult times and really show our true colors, which is that we are a community that cares about each other. We're a community that cares about diversity. Um, we're a community that will stand up in tough times and come together, that will put aside our differences. And it's those moments that truly make me um, proud to have served on the Santa Cruz City Council um, in the capacity of city council member, vice mayor, and mayor of Santa Cruz in 2020. Um, I want to thank the voters and the community for giving me the opportunity um, for, for electing me to serve in this capacity. Um, I, I never would have imagined that I would have been uh, become mayor of a city in my entire life, let alone be on the city council. And I just want to thank you all for giving me that opportunity to truly um, pour my passion into um, our policy and decision making here. Um, in addition to thanking the voters for this opportunity, I do want to just thank uh, our city staff. Um, there's so many people who make this, um, who work tirelessly to make the city function. And um, many of them have multiple jobs, but they do it because of how passionate they are about this place and how much they care about this place. And I know that not only our city staff, but many of the people who live in this community, um, they work really hard to be here because they care so much about uh, the community of Santa Cruz. And as someone who's lived all over the world, um, I will say that what really draws me to Santa Cruz and what's the most important thing about this community are the people. It's beautiful. Yes, we have oceans. Yes, we have surf and forest. But it's really the people here in Santa Cruz that make this place so special. And I'm honored to have been able to um, serve you all and to represent you all over the last four years. And I just say, I guess the last thing I'd like to say, um, well, one, I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right across the river. And so I look forward to continuing working with you all. Um, but I do want to say that, you know, there are some major challenges ahead of us that we're really going to need to focus on and put a lot of effort into. I think, as I mentioned before, how important the people of this community are. We really need to figure out how we can make sure that we're protecting them. And I, what I mean by that is that there are so many people in this community who are continuously getting pushed out. We know that there are um, older landlords in this community who've kept rents low, um, who might be getting out of the business in the next 10 years. And as we see less and less affordable housing, um, we're going to have to think about how we're going to secure our workforce um, keep Santa Cruz weird, support our small businesses, and it's going to take all of us coming together and really working together to make sure that we can keep Santa Cruz a place for everyone. And so with that, I'll just end by saying I appreciate uh, having served and worked with everyone on this current council configuration um, and past council configurations that we've had since my time in office. And I look forward to working with you all moving forward. And welcome to the new uh, council members. Uh, it's council member Scott Newsom. Welcome, uh, Mayor Fred Keeley. And I look forward to working with you all as well. And with that, I will empty this seat and leave it for somebody else. Thank you Before very much. Before you go, I have one thing. I want to take this opportunity to present uh, Justin Cummings with a key to the city. He has worked tirelessly these last four years um, and has really passionately put a lot of work and um, heart into doing the best that he can. And I am very proud and honored to have worked with him this year. So it, was, it is my pleasure to present Justin Cummings, with the key to the city, this will always be a place for you. All right, Council Member Myers. Well, I think it's fitting that we all um, hopefully sp spent a lot of time smiling tonight. Um, because we've really been kind of through hell and back over the last four years. We've lost a lot of people in this community for all kinds of different reasons. 
And, uh, you know, we have really tried to take care of each other through all these crazy things that we've experienced. And uh, so I, you know, I think it's important to, to be here, to be happy, to be smiling, um, and to celebrate, you know, being from Santa Cruz. And uh, we're a quirky little town, and uh, we've enjoyed most of the time here up on this dais um, as a council of various makeups. Um, and there's been some, you know, honestly, some pretty brutal times up on this dais as well. So this is not a, uh, a, uh, a service for the faint of heart by any means. Um, but, you know, that just means we have a very uh, passionate community. And um, it's important to try to serve as many of those people as you can, or at least listen to all those perspectives um, to the extent that you can while you're raising your families and working full time and doing all the other things that kind of keep everything, the wheels on the bus, as they say. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think my um, greatest privilege is, is serving with the people who are here with me at this point in time. Um, I do want to do a shout out for um, the growing uh, leadership of women in our community. Um, I think that I have experienced something pretty um, phenomenal here where we have um, strived to be imperfect or um, to solve every problem, but to try to take a step towards at least something about a lot of the hard things. And that's um, voting for housing when people don't support it. It's bringing dollars to a, probably the biggest problem in California and our nation, homelessness, and knowing that whatever we design is not going to be perfect. But if I get 35 people in housing in my term as a city council member, I'm going to call that a big success. So, you know, it's, um, it's been a real privilege to have the debates and not agree on everything. <laughs> Um, and Sandy and I don't debate everything. Um, and that's what really democracy is about, right? It's about getting a group of people who do not agree on something 100% of the time and figuring out how to talk about it civilly and how to support each other in compromise and um, hopefully in getting things done, which is the most important thing for every community. Um, so I just feel really lucky to do this. Um, and it's been a total trip, to be honest. And um, I still am kind of a little bit amazed that I stepped into the, into the pool, but I've tried to tread water as much as I can over the last few years. Um, and I, too, also just want to say that the people who really make the city of Santa Cruz run are the people sitting on the outskirts of this dais and the people who do everything for us every day, whether it's, you know, running Loud Nelson, taking care of the swimming pool, getting the pump going so that the pool's not freezing cold, um, showing up on the wharf during giant storms and trying to figure out how to keep the place together. Um, it's really the people and the staff of the city of Santa Cruz that is the city of Santa Cruz. And, you know, we're lucky to sit up here and kind of think about big things and try to, like, maybe, you know, do, do cool stuff. But at the end of the day, we're not out there in the pouring down rain, cleaning out the storm drains or, you know, sitting up with us till one in the morning, listening to us pontificate about how we're going to save the world. <laughs> Um, so, you know, again, I just want to really recognize um, this entire staff, and I do want to recognize Matt Huffaker. Um, he is our new city manager, and I think if there was one thing I did right in my term um, as mayor, I gave the time for this council to figure out how to hire an extraordinary person who is going to take us into the future. And uh, so, Matt, I'm just so glad, and I think of you as, as one of my proudest moments as mayor because I think you're bringing us to new places. So, thanks everybody. I'm so honored and happy to present you with a key to the city so that I know that as you move on, you will always remember your time here and I just wish you well. Thank you for all you've done as a public servant here in the city of Santa Cruz. And now I'm out of here. Thank you. 
Um, thank you so much to uh, Council Member Cummings, Council Member Myers for serving this last four years for the city of Santa Cruz. I'm very happy I had the opportunity to work two of those years with them side by side. Uh, learned a lot. I think um, one thing I've developed as mayor is an insane capability to manage so many incoming things at an unrealistic rate. <laughs> um, as this year comes to an end, so does my role as mayor. I'm so happy and delighted to continue on with another two years on city council. There is still so much work to be done, and I'm happy that um, that I get to continue with that work. So with that, I have a few outgoing remarks before I hand it over. Um, I want to express my sincerest thanks to my colleagues this year, Vice Mayor Watkins, Council Member Brown, Council Member Cummings, Council Member Golder, Council Member Myers, and Council Member Kalantari Johnson. It has always been clear to me that we each love this city. We take our roles seriously. We have sacrificed a lot in service to this community. And we've done what we believe is right. Individually and as a group, we have protected and grown this city to make it better for our residents and the community for the future. As a public servant to be in service for the people in Santa Cruz is remarkable and inspiring, and I'm so glad to have worked through it all with you all. I also want to thank our city staff. Um, I had the wonderful pleasure of starting my year as mayor alongside our new city manager, Matt Huffaker. And we jumped in together for this year. And um, I'm just so happy to have worked alongside you and to have really um, worked through some really complex, difficult topics and solutions and processes and ways through that we could all come together and make progress forward. Um, I know you care. I know that we will continue making good work together. Thank you to the city attorney and your whole team. I know that, um, I don't know if you sleep. I mean, I know I don't <laughs> sleep. I can't imagine. I think it's really important to understand the breadth of work and reading and research that we all do, but certainly the city attorney's office. I know you have a whole team, but I know you respond sometimes, you know, late at night and um, you've, you know, really provided legal perspectives um, and case studies and interesting information from other cities that all of this helps inform our decisions and understanding in um, how we make policy. Um, I think also some of the things I really sat and thought about um, that I've learned this year is um, to pause before reacting and I'd like to share some of these thoughts with our new <laughs> incoming council members. Council member Golder has already been here, um, but to create space to make an informed choice rather than an emotional one, um, and to work on putting yourself in another person's perspective, um, and remembering, I know this was something I came to a realization that our reality is a matter of our own unique perspective, and there are multiple realities in our world, and that doesn't invalidate anyone else's reality. And so um, this year, we had on any given council agenda, um, typically um, more than 500 pages or so, um, and reading and topics, but we were able to impact and make decisions for the city on police and fire protection, budget, taxes, city employee salaries, the arts, water resiliency and supply, utility rates, trees, transportation, 
parking, gun control, road maintenance, homelessness, housing, workforce housing, parks, land use, racial equity, diversity, water, quality, sewers, climate change, vendor contracts, business health, better access to housing and employment. We started working on updating our housing element. We passed resolutions around racial equity. We established a children's fund and we voted today on committee members for that um, oversight committee. We set up a homelessness response team. We spent months planning and building resources to systematically end our largest unmanaged encampment in San Lorenzo Park. We stood up two safe alternative shelter options and connections to county health services and needs. We received our quarterly update today with all of those details. We started the first city supported safe parking program for RVs. We implemented uh, new um, street sidewalk vending programs um, along Beach Street. And um, we also, for the first time in years, have three city housing developments in process, all of which include 100% affordable, under market rate housing. Our new uh, main library branch, 21st Century Library, with 124 affordable rate and low income homes next to it, as well as Pacific Station South and Pacific Station North, the two developments at the Metro bus station, one which has already broken ground on Pacific Avenue. We've received grant funding and helped fund low-income housing. Um, we've worked with our county behavioral health programs, supporting our residents. Um, and in order to accomplish all of the work this year, we've attended council meetings, committee meetings, hearings, board meetings, public meetings, liaison meetings, neighborhood meetings, and public events, and preparing for each. It's a lot of time and commitment. Ask my friends and family, as I've often been MIA for most of the year. And to most people's surprise, it's uh, not a paid salary wa wage. You're doing it because you love this community and you want to contribute to making it better. So for those who aren't returning, um, you've definitely earned a break. Um, please continue to give us the benefit of your wisdom and experience. I'm uh, looking forward to working um, alongside uh, Council Member Cummings, now Supervisor Cummings, soon to be. Uh, and and to those who are joining us, our newly elected mayor and council members, thank you so much for your willingness to serve. Thank you, Council Member Golder, for running for a second term. It's a lot of work and sacrifice, and I would do it all over again because we have made so much progress for our people and the city, for our environment, for so many things for um, our common values, and we've come together for common good. Santa Cruz is not like any other place, and we have 63,000 people that, um, you know, really, we, we're all working together to make this um, continue to move forward, and um, I really want to thank all of our department heads to our temporary employees, you are everything in this city. Thank you for making it work. I can't express how grateful. <laughs> it's a little emotional, but um, um, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with everyone over the next two years as council member. So thank you. I will hand it now to our city clerk, Bonnie Bush. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I could, where'd Councilmember Golder go? <laughs> there she is. Okay. 
<laughs> so thirsty. If I could have Councilmember Golder, elected Mayor Fred Keeley, and elected Councilmember Scott Newsom, come to the front here. Hi, Scott Newsom. Do you solemnly affirm, you solemnly solemnly affirm that I will support and defend that I will support and defend, defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, foreign and domestic, against, against all, all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance. That, that I will bear, bear truth, truth, faith, and, and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States, to the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of California, and the Constitution of the State of California, that I take this obligation freely, that, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation, without any mental reservation, or purpose of evasion, or or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully, and, and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge, discharge the, the duties, duties upon which I'm about to enter. Upon of which, which I'm, I'm about, about to, to enter. enter. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get, I'll, I'll get into the Good evening. I'd like to uh, begin this portion by acknowledging and asking for remarks from Councilmember Golder. Thank you. Um, I wrote some things down, but now I'm feeling nervous about saying it. But I just want to say, having served for the past three years, I've learned a lot, and I'm really proud of the accomplishments that we were able to achieve working together. Um, I agree with the remarks of Mayor Bruner that it's not just about us, but it's really about the city staff and all the employees and the community members that work to, um, to make Santa Cruz what it is. We work together. We passed the Children's Fund. We walked through encampments and cleaned up the river and did beach cleanups. We voted to build almost 500 units of housing in the past two years. We've supported cr critical infrastructure projects, including roads, water, public works. We worked on beach street vending and outdoor um, dining and eviction protections, assisting small businesses during the pandemic. We have been working really hard on downtown re redevelopment, and I know some of those projects have been in the work since before I was born and throughout the earthquake and it's great to see them maybe breaking down in or breaking ground in my lifetime um, we do still have a lot to do and I know we get a lot of emails every week about the things that we're not doing right but I am really proud of the accomplishments that we've made 
including the rail trail, services to homelessness, services for homelessness, getting our town ready for climate change, um, supporting our city workers and eliminating those bottom steps, hiring a new city manager, electing an at-large mayor. And I think throughout this time, my goals have not changed. I really wanna make sure Santa Cruz is safe and clean and the residents are able to enjoy a high quality of life. We consider health on all policies and Santa Cruz should be a place where we're proud to live here and we're proud to share it with visitors that come to share the rivers, the, be or the river, the beaches, the restaurants, the business or whatever they wanna come and see. And moving out of the pandemic and into a recession, I'm not naive in thinking it's gonna be easy, but I'm really proud to be working with you guys and optimistic in the work that we're gonna do over the next few years to help continue to build affordable housing, work for, workforce housing, keep the population diverse, keeping our parks and beaches clean. We need to address critical infrastructure like our library and our wharf and things that um, we've neglected through deferred maintenance. Um, we need to treat the employees with respect and make sure that we are paying them fairly and treating them well so that we have the highest quality in the fire, police, public works, water, resource recovery, IT, <laughs> HR, whatever department we have. And they really do make Santa Cruz what it is day in, day out. And I just want to say that I'm humbled and I can't believe everybody supported me and continues to believe in me <laughs> to help um, Santa Cruz's unique and challenging and lively problems in the years to come. And special thanks to my family out there. They actually came. And, um, <laughs> and to my friends and everyone that helped on my campaign. And I just really appreciate the love and support in this community. And I'm excited to serve again. Thank you. The chair recognizes Council Member Newsom for remarks. Thank you. Uh, I want to begin uh, by first stating how incredibly honored and humbled I am to have been chosen by the voters of District 4 as a representative. I am truly grateful for the support I received during my campaign and to be trusted and trusted uh, with such an honorable position in our community. I am also honored and humbled to be sitting at this dais surrounded by such incredible and talented colleagues. I very much look forward to working with you uh, during this upcoming year and beyond uh, as we address uh, the issues uh, that face our, our great city and build on the work you have done. Uh, I also want to thank uh, my wife and my two young children. <laughs> <laughs> that was perfect for time. <laughs> Your support, love, and infectious laughter carried me through my campaign and will assuredly carry me over the next four years. I also want to thank my friends. Uh, your support was instrumental in me sitting here today and is something I'll always be thankful for. The district that I'm lucky to represent, District 4, is a very diverse district. As I stated often in my campaign, District 4 is an amazing combination of the city's economic drivers and neighborhoods. Uh, the district runs from the main beach into downtown, then up through parts of the west side to the entrance of UCSE at the corner of Bay and High. As a representative of this diverse and vibrant district, I have several priorities. Uh, one priority will be to address our community's housing needs. Another priority will be to promote economic uh, recovery and growth. I will also work to address homelessness in our community, uh, to provide kids in our great community with great parks and after school programs, and to preserve our wonderful natural environment. Overall, I will be a tireless voice for, our, for my district who will work to ensure the voices of everyday people in my district are heard. In closing, I just want to say that during the campaign, I was asked, what is your dream for the Santa Cruz community? My response was for all members of our community, especially young people, to be able to settle down here and build careers and have a life that they wish. The mo underlying motivation for that dream is a better future for all, a future where all community members can thrive. My hope is my work and the work of this council over the next four years will help us move towards that dream. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, friends and neighbors. 
this is an honor to be here. I would ask if you would uh, allow me a couple of personal comments, and then I'll move to uh, some public policy comments. I'd like to acknowledge my lovely wife, Barbara, who is here this evening with us. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for everything you do for me in my life. My one and only brother from, flew out from New York to be here, Terry Keeley. Thank you so much for coming out. And uh, thank you for, Terry, thank you for making it possible for our stepmother, Carol Keeley, to be here this evening as well. Carol, thank you for being here. I want to also thank uh, a couple of other folks as we move along here. Uh, also sitting in the front row is a uh, co-legislator uh, who, from whom and with whom I have learned a great deal about the honesty and integrity of public service. Johan Kleis, thank you for all of yours. <laughs> Supervisor-elect, thank you for all of your public service here and the service you're going to perform hand in glove with your former city colleagues over the next four years. Congratulations on your election. Look forward to working with you, sir. Donna Myers, thank you. You are brilliant. Uh, your grasp of very complex issues, and especially those involving the environment, have been a guiding light for this community, not only in your public service, but in all the other ways you serve the folks in the Monterey Bay Area. Thank you, Donna, very much. <laughs> Colleagues, I am looking forward to this work together. I, except for Mr. Newsom, I've known all of you for years and years, and think the world of each and every one of you. Your public service is valued and appreciated, and I think we will do good work together. A couple of thoughts. It does seem to me that where we are in time at this moment is that we are, perhaps, or arguably, we are in the third inflection point in our community in the modern era of Santa Cruz. Uh, we know that when the University of California regents decided in the late 50s and early 60s to locate a campus of that fine, in fact, outstanding public university, I say that because I'm terribly jealous having gone to San Jose State University and always <laughs> having to look up to people at the University of California. But nonetheless, uh, I, uh, I do think it's uh, not debatable whether the arrival at the University of California has had a profound and continuing impact on our community. I do think that there is a uh, sense of irony for the folks who in the 1950s and 60s we're advocating to the regents of the University of California that they should, in fact, locate here. And this was a relatively sleepy retirement community. And I would bet if you ask the folks who were here at the time and were the advocates at the time that they will tell you that what they thought they were getting is very different than what they got. And from the time they thought that they were getting a University of California and maybe some uh, fraternities and sororities and it was all just going to be fine and everybody would be having a good time. Uh, between the time the university regents made the decision to locate here and the time they built it and opened the first uh, classroom for students, every, every university, public university campus in the United States of America had changed. And this one was no different. And I know for some people that was a disturbing change for them. And for many years, what we found is that the university, in fact, made a profound difference, not only academically, but also in terms of the culture and the nature of our community. 
I think the second big change took place when the earthquake took place in 1989. And in that intervening period of time, the major public policy challenges, I believe, were how do you manage the growth and the impacts of a university arriving, and perhaps more importantly, living next door to the most powerful economic engine in the world, which my brother was part of for a goodly number of years, thank you. And what that powerful economic engine did, and still does every single day, is that it places great pressure on us to be something they want us to be. And being able to manage that growth carefully and thoughtfully was what folks such as Gary Patton and others did a marvelous job in fashioning Measure J in 1978 and others who in the city of Santa Cruz as elected officials set forth and the voters adopted the Greenbelt Initiative. These were designed so that we are in charge of our own destiny to the degree that is possible for a government to do that. I think they did an outstanding job of that. We don't have offshore oil drilling. We have a national marine sanctuary. We don't have a community of 30,000 homes between here and Davenport, a nuclear power plant at Davenport. We instead have the Chitoni Coast Aries National Monument. The time between the university arriving and the earthquake, it seems to me, was a time when the challenge was manage our growth, protect our environment. That trumped everything. And our elected officials responded in, in kind. The earthquake occurs in 1989. When that occurs, we are literally shaken to our core. People died. Businesses and homes physically collapsed. The economy was challenged like never before. And someone who sat in this seat for two consecutive terms, one of the most wonderful elected officials I've ever met in my life, Marty Wormhout, and the other council members at the time led us through a process, a long process, an intense process of deciding what is it we can preserve, Cynthia Matthews, what is it we can preserve? And where are the opportunities to do some new things that we hadn't thought we were capable of doing? And out of that process came a revitalized city of Santa Cruz. Its residents, its government were changed as a result of that natural occurrence. I do believe that the third inflection point just occurred on November 8th. Not because I was elected, <laughs> but, because, but because what happened is that the voters chose to change their government structure. Whether that ballot measure was imperfect or not, whether it was the best choice that could have been made, ranked choice voting, all kinds of other options, what in fact the voters did was they chose six council districts and a directly elected mayor. I think that change in governance is profound. I believe that what we will see going forward are what I mean in a very complimentary way, neighborhood politicians such as Scott Newsom, such as Renee Golder, who are elected by their district they're going to know lots about their district, and they will be advocates for their district. They will be fierce in that, but they will also look citywide. The job of mayor, it seems to me, in this new world order that's been established, is to try to see if there can be some overarching citywide looks and actions taken that respect the districts that we now have and that we will complete in 2024 in that election by electing four more folks elected by district. I do think that what that gives us is an opportunity to embrace the change that I believe is in the body politic now. I think that the folks like me who were in our 20s, 30s, and 40s in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s 
that our job as elected officials at the time was to make sure that we could manage our growth, make sure we didn't lose our sense of self, both in the city of Santa Cruz and in the county at large. I do think that what we just saw in November was not only a change in governance structure, but I do believe it was the dawn of a new majority in the city. People who were my age in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or my age, we had the opportunity essentially to respond to issues when we were younger. My sense is that the voters of the city of Santa Cruz, especially those in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, their issue is not, I need to protect the environment because every moment it's under threat, like it was back in the day. They believe that the council and policymakers and the voters made excellent choices on how to protect the environment, how to protect ourselves from being overrun or becoming something someone else wanted us to be. But I think what is happening now is that, as you've heard council members say this evening and our two departing colleagues, is that before you would hear, we want to manage our growth, we want to protect our environment, we want to do this. But I'm guessing that both Mr. Newsom and I believe the returning member that what you heard is the same thing I heard during this campaign. Two issues were dominant. When you walked door to door, when you went to events, you talked to people. Homelessness and affordable housing. I want to be able to live here. I want to do that. I grew up here, I want to be able to live here. I want my family, I want to grow my family in this community. Not because we've, we've abandoned our deep, deep commitment to the environment, but because we baked that in. And now we have a set of new challenges. And I think as we move to this district election system, we will see that there are fierce advocates for districts, but that as a council as a whole, that we will respond in fact to the new demands of the electorate. A couple more thoughts, one, it has been my great privilege now to serve in four elected public offices as a county supervisor, a county treasurer, a state legislator, and now as the directly elected mayor. In every one of those, every one of those positions, what I always remind myself, Mike Honda and I will tell you a little story. Mike Honda and I walked onto the assembly floor in 1996. And we stopped just as we walked onto the floor. And we looked at each other and said, did you feel that? I said, yeah, I sure did feel that, Mike. And it's this little chill you get. It's this feeling that you've now got a very deep and, 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 and sincere obligation that you're carrying with you. And if you ever stop feeling that, Mike and I made a pledge to, the, to each other. If you ever stop feeling that when you walk on the floor, then just keep walking. I had that feeling again tonight. Because what is in fact happening in the democracy when you get elected is you don't become the boss of anything. You are a public servant. You are the people's representative to the government, not the government's representative to the people. And keeping that at the forefront of my mind has helped me in public service. I'm in, indebted to and deeply grateful to the voters of the city of Santa Cruz to give me this opportunity to re-enter public life as an elected official and to work with this brilliant, brilliant combination of colleagues to work with and an extraordinarily talented city staff at all levels of our government. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.
mayor would recognize a council member for a motion regarding the election of the vice mayor. Council member Kalantari Johnson, you're recognized for that purpose. Thank you, Mayor, and welcome to this dais. I'd like to nominate Council Member Golder for Vice Mayor. Is there a second? I'll go ahead and second that. There's a motion and a second. Are there any other nominations? Seeing, hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Golder. Aye. <laughs> um, Council Member, it's going to take me some getting used to. Council Member <laughs> Bruner. Aye. Um, Councilmember Brown. Aye. Councilmember Watkins. Aye. And the Councilmember Newsom. Aye. And Mayor Keeley. Aye. Is there further business to come before the council this evening? Further business? Nope. No further business. Motion to adjourn would be in order. It is non debatable. Is there a motion to adjourn? <laughs> It's a motion to adjourn, a second, non-debatable. Those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. No. Motion carries. Woo!